the, the 13th meeting of the Economy Committee um, and obviously due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place in regards to COVID-19, some members are attending this morning's meeting via teleconference and our witnesses are also briefing the committee via teleconference. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablet devices by pressing F4 on their machines. Um, item number one then is apologies and we have apologies from Stuart Dixon and everybody else is here. Um, item number More on the phone chair than we thought we were going to have so if, if the room looks a bit empty that's why. Um, Item number two then is the draft minutes. Um, they are on page four of your pack. Um, are members content with the, the minutes? Great. And then um, we also have a record of decisions that were taken by correspondence and they are on page four of your table pack. Are members content with that as well? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, item number three then is chairperson's business. Um, and this morning, I just want to again extend my condolences to the family of my constituency colleague, John Dallet, um, and also to his, his um, wider, wider family circle and friends, and of course his SDLP um, colleagues. And I, I, I would also like to extend the committee's condolences to, to all of those who've lost loved ones during this time. And we all recognise the very different, difficult experience it is for families who are grieving at this point um, and who have who aren't able to, to have normal wakes and funerals, and it's very, very difficult for people. Um, moving on then to item number four, we have uh, an oral briefing via teleconference from um, the Chambers of Com Commerce, from Derry Chamber, Newry Chamber, Belfast Chamber, and Causeway Chamber. Um, and on the line this morning, we have um, Paul Clancy, um, from Derry Chamber, Colin Shannon from Newry Chamber, and Simon Hamilton from Belfast Chamber, and Karen Yates from Causeway Chamber. Members, there is um, the Chambers of Commerce COVID-19 survey at page 12 of your pack. There's a briefing from Newry Chamber at page 14, a briefing from Derry Chamber at page 17, and then the, the NI Chamber and BDO survey um, on, cash flow, on the cash flow crisis at page 20 of your packs. Chair, just before we go on, can I just remind everyone um, who's not speaking just to mute your phone? Otherwise, we get a little bit of noise interference and feedback. So when you're about to speak, on mute. When you're not speaking, just mute your phone, please. Thank you. OK. Um, so if the, the members of the chambers would like to give us an, an opening statement, and then we'll invite members to come in with questions. This is where technology works really well. So um, if we could just take the chair in the order. So if Paul Clancy wants to speak first. Yes, I, I do that. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to thank the committee for the invitation this morning. Um, I have to say that I was very disappointed in the fact that the committee for the invitation this morning. I have to say that I was very disappointed in the fact that the committee for the invitation this morning. To make this happen, and most recently the bounce back loan, which has been very well received, and the welcome news that there will be a forty million pound hardship fund for micro businesses who, who have not yet been able to access support. But at this stage now, a large portion of our members are planning for the restart. And in our survey, uh, we had approximately sixty percent of businesses at the time of the, at the time in April or who were surveyed and were planning to use job retention scheme. And I guess the questions we have now in terms of members' concerns really is about the communication of the phase plan to restart the economy. And I suppose being in the northwest and being a border county as well, uh, you know, straddled by the border, we have a lot of cross trade. And it would be very beneficial to know, you know, what the coordinated phase opening of businesses are to try and coordinate as much as possible, as practically across, as possible across the border for two reasons really. Uh, one is to reduce... Uh, the, the travel risk of spreading the virus, and the other one is keeping you know business local. Um, and the other area too would be to know what the plans are to support the job retention scheme beyond the end of June, and what that could look like. Obviously, businesses are planning at the moment, and you know they want to try and bring back as many people as they possibly can into the workforce, and they really do need clarity on that. So they're the two main concerns, if you like, from the Northwest region for the moment. 
um, Colin Shannon. You would like to. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to the committee about the impact of COVID-19 on Uri. If I could maybe just spend around five minutes uh, as allocated just to go through some of the the impacts on on the Uri area. And I suppose many of you will know our region. And at the beginning of the year, we were probably one of the fastest growing local economies in Northern Ireland with no real in unemployment. Uh, but today, nearly 80% of our businesses are closed or operating uh, from home. And uh, probably un unlike any other economic crisis, I think the challenge of COVID-19 has been the sudden nature with no time to prepare and with markets and customers basically disappearing overnight. And as Paul has mentioned, the, the furlough scheme has been vital. And in the Geary area, probably about 70 percent of our businesses uh, have furloughed uh, all or some of, some of their staff. Uh, but the sorts of issues and concerns that, that they, they have been raising with us is uh, cash flow. And we've heard that from a lot of areas. But about a quarter of our businesses have only about one to three months of cash reserves. Um, uh, the other issue that, that they're raising is that about 50% of them believe that their uh, employment requirements, in other words, their staff requirements, will probably be about 25% less uh, than it was in March without further, further support. Um, and we need to look as well, there's been a lot of communication around the importance of social distancing, but how we rebuild consumer and uh, customer confidence uh, to come back into the marketplace. And that will be a particular issue for, for retail and hospitality. Uh, which is very, very important in, in, in the Uri area. Paul, Paul has mentioned uh, the border issue, and obviously that's something for, for Uri as well. And uh, we would like to see, uh, now that there's a roadmap in the south, we would like to see an equivalent and realistic one uh, in, in Northern Ireland as well, and, and some form of alignment so that we don't have like a two-tier uh, system with one system operating on one side of the border and another uh, in, in our area. Um, in terms of support, I mean, as Paula said, there's been a very broad welcome in our area as well with the comprehensive nature of the support package in place from both the executive and, and central government. And furlough, as I said earlier, has been, has been vital, but we can't have that cliff edge in June with the scheme coming to a sudden end. Otherwise, we will face uh, significant redundancies um, and it would defeat the whole purpose of the scheme if that was to happen. And we know there's some work going on and the chance of looking at that, uh, but we would encourage them to look at, at potential extensions to the furlough scheme, whether that is just a flexible approach or, or a broader extension. I think it would be most welcome again uh, in hospitality and retail. That would be that would be vital. Business rate support has been important and the executive is looking at that. Uh, a lot of our businesses may be opening on a gradual basis and will probably be an economic loss in, in the short term, so they will need some continuing support. And if the executive can look at that, and um, that would be that would be uh, very valuable. One of the areas Paul touched on was the hardship fund. And in Uri, we have a number of shared service offices where businesses pay a monthly rent or service charge and have been excluded from the grant scheme. And there are many types of businesses like this in Northern Ireland and the deep enterprise centres. And often these companies are starter companies with the potential to become our future successful businesses. Without support now, they, they will be killed off. And we haven't seen the criteria for the hardship loan, but we hope that, that businesses like this will, will be covered uh, will be covered by, uh, by the hardship loan. Um, we need, and I've mentioned uh, before, the whole issue of social distancing. Uh, but the, the advice needs to be clear and unambiguous so that our businesses know uh, what they have to do and how they have to do it. Uh, in the longer term, I mean, the executive's uh, long-term plan has to look at significant public investment. So we do really welcome this week's $700 million for city deals, and URI uh, will benefit particularly from that and particularly from, uh, we hope, the Southern Relief Road which will not be just important for our area, but the broader Northern Ireland economy. Um, the other issue is investment in, in our education and colleges. Um, Newry has a very strong relationship between the education and colleges sector. And if we are to rebuild our economy again, we need the right skills. So we do need ongoing support and investment for schools, uh, schools and colleges. Um, 
the, the, I suppose my final point about what business would be looking for is that in most areas, there's a very strong business support infrastructure in terms of Invest NI, Intertrade, the local councils, enterprise centres, and indeed local chambers networks, like we're speaking to you this morning. But that business support, the executive has to make sure that that business support is done in a coordinated way and there are no gaps. And I mean, sometimes what we find is that the smaller businesses that are maybe not aligned to invest in AI or indeed to enter trade can fall through through the gaps. Um, so maybe to conclude, um, from a new perspective, I think we're, we're at the beginning of this economic crisis and a lot of support has been provided but we're really only at, at the start. And while that support is welcome, I think it needs to be it needs to be ongoing. We have a real, I suppose, entrepreneurial spirit in the new area, and we will recover from this in the long term. But we do need a, a long-term uh, effective stimulus and recovery plan from, from the executives. So uh, thank you for, for listening uh, this morning. And when it's safe to do so, I hope the, near, uh, the committee can come to, to Newry on a visit. Thank you. Been before. Um, Simon. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, in, in all in all my days, um, whether I was sitting in the chair that you're occupying or at the other end of it, or around the, the, the table, I never envisaged that I'd ever be giving evidence to the uh, committee from my front room. Um, uh, I'm watching you all on the, the my laptop. Um, the advantage of, of not being there, I suppose, is you can't see the state of my hair, which hasn't been cut for several weeks. But I suppose the disadvantage for me is that I can now see Mr. Stalford's um, uh, new hairstyle in, in live and living colour. <laughs> thank, thank you um, for, for taking the time to, to listen to us in our, our presentation today and for receiving our, our survey recently. Um, our our organisations are the voice of, of business uh, in our cities and, and sub-regions across Northern Ireland and, and we represent not just the uh, hundreds of members but also um, several, several thousand, tens of thousands of employees that they have. I think the, there's no other way to, to, to put it. The results of our, our survey um, paint a very, very clear picture of the economy in Belfast and, and the other areas that were surveyed. Uh, in the city alone, there's only 6% of businesses that are currently um, physically open, um, the impact of being able to work from home in many cases, the um, drying up of tourism, and, and the fact too that the city centre has no real significant population has had a huge impact on on many businesses. There's only one third of uh, members surveyed in Belfast who are eligible for either of the executive's grants, and I believe that's as a result of the use of the NAV levels and the small business rates relief really, and because of Belfast's very high um, rateable value, obviously many were uh, excluded. Uh, and 83% of, of, of members who were surveyed said that they were going to uh, furlough staff. The, the sectors that are hit the hardest, uh, as you might expect, are, are retail, hospitality uh, and the charity um, social enterprise sector, who I know we heard some good evidence from last week. Um, the impact on Belfast is, is significant. There are many sectors who continue to trade well, of course, uh, the tech sector amongst them. Um, but those other sectors that are um, struggling, that has a, a ripple effect on the rest of the region um, because Belfast, is, uh, as we know, is the economic driver for the entire region. 30% uh, of jobs are in Belfast, 25% of the rate take comes from Belfast and, and half of all out-of-state visitor spend comes from, from Belfast. So. We often say in Belfast Chamber that Belfast, when Belfast does well, Northern Ireland does well, but the opposite is also true as well. In terms of other issues I just want to, to touch on, I think it, it, given the fact that we are um, thankfully now past the peak of, of COVID-19, there's a lot of work still to do and we all have to obviously continue to follow the guidance that has been uh, issued to ensure that we can protect the NHS and, and save lives. The fact that we are past the peak, I think it is right now that we turn our thoughts to how we reopen. Uh, many businesses are open, many are opening, many are planning for reopening. Um, they are not, particularly in those customer facing sectors like retail and hospitality, it is not that they are demanding a date that we are opening, but they want to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel almost, that there's some hope that they can get open, and most importantly, that they can plan and they can prepare and they can put whatever measures they need to put in place for that. So those businesses are, are really looking for advice and they're looking for guidance. 
um, particularly in respect of the impact um, on not just their own premises, but around their premises. So if there are businesses that have to put queuing mechanisms or systems in place, which limit the number of people who can come into stores. I've spoken to some members in the last couple of days whose stores in other parts of Europe have opened and there have been huge queues of people trying to get in. There is a need for guidance and support and help as to how that can be safely done. Um, even though businesses are, are going to reopen, um, it's not going to be business as usual. Footfall is not going to get back to anywhere near where it was pre-coronavirus. Um, so that support that has come through, whether it's from national government or from the assembly or from the executive, which has been gratefully received and has been hugely helpful, and particularly want to thank uh, the economy minister for the announcement of the hardship fund yesterday. That's something that Belfast Chamber and, and the other chambers on this call have been uh, asking for for some time that will help out many, many businesses who have fallen through those gaps in, in the, the grand scheme to date. Many, much of that support will need to continue to happen because opening is not going to be opening like it would normally be. So whether that's furloughing or a flexible furloughing or an extension of the rates holiday, um, that type of support is going to need to continue to ensure that we have jobs and livelihoods and businesses protected in the longer term. I also want to echo what Colin has said in respect of looking at longer term economic recovery and um, particularly welcome the announcement by the finance minister uh, around the city deal that's going to have uh, um, uh, the city deals rather that's going to have a hugely positive impact on not just the economy of Belfast but the entire region uh, and that, that money that has been committed by the executive I think is rightly um, focusing on recovery in the long term as well as uh, helping rescuing businesses in the short term. Karen? Um, hi, everybody. Um, I want to echo the, the comments of everybody else in terms of welcoming um, the support that has been um, offered um, and, and greatly received by the businesses. In terms of the, the Causeway Coast, um, we're currently setting, we, we've, we've redone the survey that you guys have the, um, the results of the previous one, and we'll share the new results with you in the next couple of days. But we're now looking at um, Pretty much 70% of the businesses up here are telling us that they're either well, 59% were closed and the others were maybe trading online. Um, so that's a huge number um, for the area. And obviously, we know that we're always, um, I suppose, seen as very much a tourism and, um, and leisure area, which we, we clearly are. But we also have, you know, manufacturing businesses um, and, and food businesses. And, and we're getting approached daily with, um, you know, what's the plan. Um, in terms of um, cash reserves, as, as Colin mentioned, that's a real issue. Um, but people are telling us that you know one to two weeks is really all the time. And 70% of our guys are saying one to two weeks is all it will take for them to be ready to be open safely. Um, the, um, the growth deal um, for here um, is clearly very important to us, as, as again, the guys have just mentioned in terms of the city deal. And I think the cementing of the education sector, we've got a new um, build coming on um, with NRC, but also, um, you know, cementing the um, Coleraine campus of Ulster University and um, potentially the, some growth there would be key for us. Um, and rather than sort of repeat, um, I, you know, what, what, what has been said before, which I completely, um, everything I, I agree with and is similar, I think um, maybe... Um, as, as I have a very much a business background, I tend to jump to solutions very quickly. So forgive me if, if, um, if that's the case. We, we do need to start, as we said, talking about recovery. Um, but I think that in terms of support going forward, um, Colin touched on the fact that we have brilliant networks through Invest NI, Enterprise NI, um, and Intertrade. Our businesses are telling us that in terms of support, it needs to actually be practical support. So people that can do things for them as opposed to train them or advise them. If we're going to move quickly, we, you know, as a, as a country of small businesses, we actually need skills and people to actually help us. We really don't want duplication across the piece. Um, that would be, and, and I, I, you know, from, from whether that's from Invest NA right down through to the um, Economic Development Through Council. Um, and I think the other thing that, that we've, on some of the conversations we've had in the last few weeks would really help is, um, if there was some way to um, you know, look at the whole procurement system and, and actually, you know, obviously everybody has to be um, you know, fit to, to fulfill any sort of procurement and go through a system and a process. 
But I think if we can um, start to look at um, there being some sort of scoring system where even at a local council level, there's a benefit from being a local business, that would be a helpful way to restart the economy. Um, and then finally, um, I've had um, a car one of the caravan um, supply uh, uh, businesses here, Blake Caravans, I think has written to the whole committee and an awful lot of other people, um, has had um, conversations with um, one of our largest food um, businesses here and one of our largest retailers who are saying, look, we have systems in place we already for how to open. We'd love to share that with you. Um, but with the announcement from um, from um, the Taoiseach around how you, they were going to open, there is a concern that we, um, if, if our coffee shops, for example, are allowed to open without um, the travel restrictions necessarily being lifted, even if it's just across Northern Ireland, then our businesses up here, if second homes and caravan sites, for example, aren't allowed to open, um, people aren't allowed to travel, there won't be enough business for the the coffee shops and the and the food outlets to serve anyway. Um, so just in terms of, of, of you know the thought process around how we open, I think we need to be um, very aware for, for certainly not just for us but for other areas that a lot of the visitors are within the country, if you like, and that that moving and ability to move around at some point when it's safe, we accept, is probably going to be one of the crucial messages that that um, that we need in order to have. Um, even the smallest queue outside um, the businesses. But, um, but, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you all very much for your input. It has been really informative. And um, um, I think that there's a lot of similar issues being highlighted, but also some, some regional issues. And, and I think that's going to be really important in terms of um, how we plan for going forward. Um, I, I would agree that we need to have a coordination across the island as well, because we can't have differentials um, particularly in relation to supply chains and other things. Um, just picking up on some of the issues that were highlighted in the original survey, one, for example, around banking, ha has that experience um, changed and um, in terms of being able to access the loan schemes and the potential for businesses to be able to access the, the new loan scheme, the bounce back? I know there has been conversation around the fact that some businesses are unwilling to take on further debt, and obviously we, that's entirely understandable. But do the new loans that are potentially coming on board um, this week change that experience at all? Can I? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to kick off just briefly. Yes, yeah, there's there's a um, in terms of the timing of our um, survey, it was. The Seabill scheme wasn't long in the market at that point, and it was pre the changes that had been made to to it, particularly around um, the issues of, of collateral um, security. Um, so I think at that time, the picture that we got from the survey was very much a mixed bag. Um, there were some businesses who had had a fairly positive experience, uh, others who were less so. Um, and those who had been going through the process at that stage reported it to be very slow and, and, and actually quite difficult um, and you're right there were many who had been put off um, just yet just didn't want to take on more more debt because of the position that the business might have been in at that time uh, and perhaps even in some of the commentary that we received um, having had a bad experience you know around 10 years ago didn't want to go back into that that sort of space too heavily um, I, I think that it, it's, it's fair to say and we, the four of us have kept in, in fairly regular contact that I think it's fair to say that across the board the response from many businesses is, is better around accessing the loans. I think that's since the change um, to the Seabill scheme and the announcement of the bounce back scheme, uh, bounce back loan scheme, I think has because it's particularly tailored at smaller businesses, and that's obviously where most of the economy in Northern Ireland is located. Um, I think that that has been fairly well received. The truth is, and, and Karen hinted that we've, we've already gone back over members and asked some of the previous questions and see trends and also to see anything new that's coming up. Um, the evidence coming through from that so far is that very few businesses are actually going to the bank um, to look for funding um, and very few are going towards this sort of public government backed um, schemes. Many are um, just extending facilities and obviously that, that can come at a cost and, and that can be you know, some, that's where maybe some of the um, concerns are raised initially. But overall, it's not the case universally. But most, most things, generally, businesses are not as heading towards the C bills or the bounce back loan scheme as 
I'm assuming will be first anticipated, um, and are also using the banks or uh, existing um, are their own existing facilities and the banks are existing products. I think I, maybe I if think I could add from. Sorry, go ahead, Con. If I could maybe add, just in terms of um, the position in URI, I mean, I think there has been a considerable engagement with the, the banks, and um, you know, we need uh, an ongoing and flexible support from our banks. I would say that I suppose the issue with our survey is that we just went out on Monday, just as the bank's bank loan was um, being launched. But there does seem to be a more of a favourable re response to it uh, than the earlier loan packages. And uh, particularly uh, because it's tailored towards smaller businesses, there's still that reluctance to get into debt. Uh, but I suppose the, the attractiveness uh, of the bounce back loan scheme is the low interest rate and the fact that there's no uh, payments in, in the first year. So certainly I've, I've seen a more uh, positive engagement from some of our local businesses about that, but still um, a nervousness uh, about, about going into debt. I, I would um, I would totally agree. I mean, what we're getting so far is people weren't considering businesses often weren't considering the original loan scheme, and when they did approach, and um, and obviously uh, the the interest rates that were on offer from the original Siebel scheme was just prohibitive for most people. Um, we are now hearing more people, even you know, slight if you like the, the, the slightly larger businesses that might have potentially been looking for more than the fifty thousand cash. <coughs> Um, investigating the bounce back loan because I think the certainty and the low interest rate um, feels, um, I'm going to use the word fair um, because that has been the word that has been used, um, uh, you know, spoken to me in, in a few cases, but it's very anecdotal at this stage. But certainly um, I would expect that um, our businesses in Syria will, um, there'll be a larger take off of the bounce back loan for certain. Thank you for that. Um, I think that the points have been well made around. Um, coordination of support going forward as well, and that's something that we will will feed through to the department. I think it's important that we don't see duplication of, of support um, and any schemes or anything like that is that is on offer. Um, and obviously, the the input in terms of planning for recovery is something that that we will want to come back to you on as well, because um, I, I think there's a lot of really and um, useful contributions there in relation to that. Um, and I think that we will need to, to, to work out how we do that best going forward. Um, I'm going to bring in Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thank you everyone for your contribution. I think we, uh, I suppose, take some um, positivity from it in relation to how um, the feedback has been in, in regarding the, the grant support to date. Um, I think what you've said, most of you, is fairly positive, I think. Simon, if, you're, if I'm correct, are you saying that only about a third of businesses in Belfast have actually got or have had access to grant support at the moment? Yeah, that was the. Um, it's just 30, 36 percent um, of, of businesses in Belfast had um, said that they were eligible for either the ten thousand or the twenty-five thousand pound grant. And um, my my view on, on why that's the case is because of the use of the particularly the 51,000 maybe level for the 25,000 pound grant meant that because Belfast just generally has a higher um, rateable values on average compared to elsewhere across Northern Ireland that that was, that was excluding many businesses in Belfast who had they been located elsewhere probably would have qualified. Yeah, so um, there, there are significant gaps there then that we obviously hope will be covered in the, in the new proposed hardship uh, scheme. But, yeah, yeah, just on that, yeah. I think we all in this committee has worked, you know, continuously on this issue, and I think um, we fully recognise the need for support for the smaller business sector, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's the service industry, or whatever. Um, I think there are significant gaps there, and I think we'll continue to, to push on that. My main point is is in the restart. Um, we're all very much aware of the recent debate and discussion about the, uh, how to manage aircraft. And the big challenge, I think, is moving forward, how we meet the health and safety requirements that are supposed number one, health, safety and hygiene, and how business can operate effectively and efficiently and still make money at the end of the day. And that's, I think, a big challenge. How do you, do you folks see 
uh, that challenge be met in, in the coming days. And I think we're all keen to see business moving forward at the right time. And we want to be there to support and, and make sure that, that, place, that the proper measures are in place. Now, if the Health and Safety Executive and, and the lo local councils bring forward a directive, uh, a directive can, be, can limit things as well, because not, it's not a case of one size fits all here. It doesn't. And I think everything has to be made and customised for the, each business. I would like your opinions on that, please. Maybe if, if I could uh, uh, kick off. I mean, the survey that we, we just launched this week, is, it only went out, um, I suppose, late, late on Monday, so we have not all the figures in yet. But, but those that responded, um, about um, nearly nearly a half of them said it would probably be ready to open safely uh, within within a week. So from the moment you're told, it would probably take about about a week um, uh, to to open to open safely. So a lot of them are putting putting plans in place in terms of what they think uh, will work in terms of social distancing. Obviously, there's going to be a, a cost on it. But for me, a key thing is is clear guidance from government so uh, a business can take uh, the guidance, can look at their own particular circumstances, and then can put an effective plan in place that mirrors what's happening, you know, in the rest of their street and indeed in neighbouring towns so that there's no unfair competition. Yeah, I think there's yeah, I, sorry, go ahead, Karen. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just going to say I think that um, certainly uh, there are businesses that, that we've been speaking to which would be um, you know, happy to share any of their planning and there's larger businesses already, you know, um, with plans in place. I think that the sense I get is that, um, you know, in the same way that we now over a short period of time have all learned that we need to, you know, have the, keep our social distance, wash our hands, you know, be very aware of all of the processes that can keep us all safe. Um, the business is saying to us, you know, we know we need to keep our staff safe, number one. We know we need to keep our then customers safe. And actually, the bit that's almost, um, uh, if you like, out of their control, particularly in the retail sector, is if there's queuing in the streets um, and how that's sort of managed and whose responsibility that is. So I think that there's, there's an, um, a lot of work going on, um, mostly actually by the unfurloughed owners of the business or the directors, I suppose, at the moment, on how they can safely open. And as Colm said, um, you know, most of them can do that within, within a week. So... Um, that work is going on, I think, across the whole of the province at the moment, um, and I'd be happy to share if that's if that's possible. Yeah, that would be yeah I, I, I agree with what the others have said. I think that there are there are, um, in most cases, you know, plans are already in place, and businesses have been looking at how they can adjust their premises to to safely work both for, for staff and, and for, for customers. Different sectors are obviously at, at different stages and they um, you know so there are some who have been open. Um, there are um, some who um, have been working towards getting open and are now at that stage. Um, I think in those who are office based, I think you will continue to see people working from home or a significant percentage of, of, of staff working from home yeah. for a period. Um, I think it's the real, that was to the, to the heart of your question, Gordon, is around, you know, customer facing businesses, you know, those who rely on footfall and people coming through the doors and that's where the challenge is going to be. And I understand the point you're making around, you know, being very, very strict about what happens because, you know, there isn't one set of premises that's exactly like the next. Um, but I think, uh, you know, advice and guide, many, many businesses will, will be part of, you know, bigger organizations who will be able to pass that sort of guidance themselves down. And I know that that is happening, but there will be others, particularly small independent retailers, for example, who will benefit from, I think, some advice and some guidance. Um, the hospitality sector is one which I think, you know, is going to be particularly challenged, has been particularly challenged throughout this. It's going to be particularly challenged as we move into reopening. Uh, not least because some of the measures that have been intimated that might have to be put in place will um, significantly impact on the experience and therefore whether people or not will um, will want to, to, to go to um, a bar, a restaurant, a pub or whatever. Um, but I, I think the, the, the point that Karen made is one that I would, would um, emphasise again, which is that businesses can largely adjust 
their own premises, uh, whether they get guidance or advice to do that or not, and they will do that because it's it's important to them for the safety of their staff and their customers. But if that space outside, um, I have a um, I'm talking with Belfast City Council, Department for Infrastructure, Department for Communities, and some others later on today about this issue about how you know what does this mean for streets and surrounding streets and, and footpaths and who polices that and how that's configured um, if there are shops or, or premises where there might be a, a queuing system outside um, to get people in. It's one thing in sort of out of town supermarkets where they have big car parks that they can do this and the space to do it. It's a different thing altogether in city centres. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Claire? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose it's just a, a few points to pick up on, and I'll begin with the one that Gordon had made around the hardship fund. Um, perhaps I'm mistaken in saying this, but I didn't anticipate that the hardship fund would extend to those businesses with a NAV of more than 51,000. And when, when the minister was in front of us last week, I think she referred to it as being a hardship fund, so it would be more likely to be those businesses who uh, didn't necessarily have the half thousand NAV or the, the 1,500 NAV. Um, and those other businesses that maybe weren't able to access it because of the nuances of way the, the, the original small business rate relief scheme has been administered. So my, my assumption is that the government is almost now expecting that those businesses would be accessing the bounce back loan and then there would be opportunity to do that. But I, I, I'd be keen to know your thoughts in and around that. Um, I also want to pick up on some of the points that Karen had made. Um, I'm quite positive that she's hearing that businesses could be ready to open safely in one to two weeks, which is really positive. But I suppose where that gets complicated is um, when government guidance comes into play and I think if we've learned anything from the past six weeks it's to pay attention to the nuance and to understand that not every business is in the same position. You know, she, she raises a really important point in relation to the caravan sites um, between those maybe coming up for a one-off weekend versus those who actually own a caravan on site and the impact that that will have um, on the wider economy if caravans are just seen to be very similar to hotels, which they indeed are not. So I, I think um, and I had forwarded on a briefing paper that one of the caravan sites had prepared to the department and I would be really keen to ensure that they, they do um, uh, kind of take guidance from the various stakeholders and actually realise that this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think um, you know, that joined-up kind of thinking around it is really key as well, because it's all very well that we open the cafes and the restaurants, but if we don't have the people coming to them, then it, it, it's in a way of, it, it's fruitless. Um, and I suppose what we also have to be mindful of is the, the ongoing support that we provide to these businesses, even when they are open, because they won't be at full capacity as they were previously. And I think the government needs to be looking at supports at that. And I, I was pleased to hear the minister last week um, uh, give her personal support, albeit having quite executive support in relation to extending the rates holiday for a year. Um, and the last point is around um, the extension of the small business grants to those with uh, rental properties or those with the with the smaller NAVs. I, I'm not sure if you're finding this, but um, I was speaking with constituents yesterday because the portal in which to access is quite ambiguous. There um, seems to be five options. I went into it myself. And the first option applies, but then also so does the fifth. But the first option allows you to proceed, but the fifth option doesn't. So I still think there are issues within the system that I think are making businesses confused and certainly my advice to those businesses is do what you can um, um, because I, I think the, the department hasn't been quite clear in putting these forward. Thank you. Would you like me to, to come? Sorry, go ahead, Karen. I was going to say, just, just really briefly, uh, on your last point, Claire, um, in terms of the portal, absolutely we are, are hearing that and I think that there are a number of businesses that um, maybe uh, let's let's say believe that the that the original ten thousand pound grant is applicable to them, but because of the way that they are uh, structured, they've fallen through. And I don't think at the moment that they're looking at the hardship fund as being feasible for them. They're still trying to work through um, with the system um, and and try and get the information. Um, this morning, it's become apparent that there's a number of um, of properties potentially that. Um, are still on the system and um, uh, are designated vacant, when in actual fact, 
um, you know, they do have tenants that have been paying um, uh, rates, and it was suggested that somebody would need to come out and inspect them, which clearly isn't, um, isn't uh, you know, um, possible. Um, and I think the only other thing I would like to say briefly is, in terms of those businesses and, and, and what, um, if you like, they're, they're allowed, I think there's a very clear understanding that depending on the sector, it doesn't matter if they get ready or not. They know they're going to have to be, if you like, allowed to open if they were in the, particularly if they're in the sector that were um, non-essential and had to close. Um, but clearly, you know, businesses are businesses and we've been taught for years to, to push and to grow. So um, they're keen to, to get moving as soon as it's safely um, you know, possible. Yeah, Claire, just one, just Claire, just one point there that you raised there about the Hartshire Fund. I think that was from Minister Dodds yesterday at one meeting we were on. She, I think she said it was a focus for businesses with one to nine people. Mm -hmm. Up to nine people working in those businesses. And the other thing you mentioned there about and consumer confidence, and uh, Colin touched on it as well, is that you know there is a need for a marketing campaign because obviously there's a lot of fear here. And although people will and businesses will put a lot of health and safety guidelines in place. I think there is a need for a greater, broader marketing campaign to encourage consumers to come out, um, because I think there would be a large sense of fear, uh, you know, when, yeah. when businesses do reopen, and I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. Just on the hardship fund, I mean, in terms of Yuri, what we were hearing was that it's essentially targeted at those businesses that that don't uh, <coughs> for pay rates and therefore a fall fall between the the gaps of the other schemes. I had mentioned earlier the, the shared service centres as being one and some enterprise centres as well. So that, that would be the type of businesses that we feel will benefit most from the hardship fund. And, and Paul's right, uh, the Minister did mention yesterday it would be targeted at businesses with one, one to nine employees. So we look forward to seeing the, the detailed criteria when it's published. Thank you. Um, John Stewart? Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Um, thanks very much, folks, for having so far. Um, just two aspects. I'm sure we're sick of talk, talking about grants, but I just want to follow up on some of that as well. Um, my office, as I'm sure the other office, are, are inundated with with um, businesses that no doubt you represent from across the country who were either originally entitled entitled to a £10,000 grant automatically but haven't received it applied for it through the portal uh, with no confirmation and haven't received it or then applied for the £25,000 grant demonstrating hardship and haven't heard anything about it. There's no helpline, there's no assistance and they can't get any word on whether they're being processed and now they're terrified that the, um, the, the, the deadline is coming up and they don't even know if their grant's being processed and do they need to reapply. Can I get a feel, because I know that your survey from a couple of weeks ago showed that a lot still hadn't been paid. Are you hearing this? Um, from your members, that ones that they are entitled to still aren't being aren't being coming through to them. Yes, I had I had um, I had one member on yesterday actually who had that who had that issue and they hadn't heard anything and they had felt they'd applied correctly. Um, that is a struggle, all right, to understand what's going on. But in general, I would have said that um, most members are satisfied the way the processes have happened. But there are individual cases where there has been some lack of communication, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think in our area it was it was slow at the beginning, um, and ironically, whenever the manufacturing companies were included, a few of those seemed to drop quite quickly uh, because people had at the beginning businesses had put the, the, their um, information in the system, and, and obviously, if you were in the system, it was easier. But I suppose. The, um, there's been a, a sort of acceptance that um, you only had um, a system that wasn't really set up for this to use, um, and so there was a bit of patience. But I think what's starting to happen now is furlough has really helped because yeah. that people have got that organised, and it's because it's all about cash flow, obviously. So furlough has helped to a point. Um, but as we get now into this month, people will get more concerned because you know a lot of people's cash flow is just so tight now. Um, that they that they need you know they obviously need the support so um, in general I would agree it's been it's been good um, but there are still people that are waiting definitely yeah, I think it, I think as organisations I think you know we all understand um, the scale of the the task that was um, before departments to you know from literally from from nowhere have to put in place um, systems that have dispensed um, around four hundred million pounds or our aims are dispense around four hundred million pounds in, in grants and 
and then there have been various adjustments made to that, including the likes of the, the hardship fund that was, was announced yesterday. So I think we, we all appreciate that this is a huge undertaking, but you know, um, we would similarly have cases. In fact, as, as I'm sitting here, an email has come through from, from one of our members who you know, is, in his reading of everything, entitled to a £25,000 grant, but hasn't been able to access it yet, and is having some difficulties getting... Um, getting somebody to um, speak to in um, LPS or wherever to, to help them out to that. So there is some evidence of that still there. But, it, it, you know, I think um, it, it, it equally there is a lot of evidence of people getting the money that they need and it's gratefully received. And it, it, along with furloughing and everything else, is greatly helping to ensure that, um, you know, those jobs and livelihoods and businesses are, are, are protected in the short term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chair, do you mind if I come back in just quickly on one other point? Nice yeah, <laughs> thanks. I'll be very brief. So, we, um, I think it was Simon was talking about market confidence and the need to get, um, you know, um, shoppers back on the streets and support retail and the other sectors whenever this starts to um, lockdown starts to um, be lifted. Um, I suppose how confident or, or what what assistance has there been for the companies you represent from the likes of the health and safety executive and even from central government in terms of the advice. Um, around social distancing and the measures they need to put in place. Um, I know con uh, businesses contacted me, likes of hairdressers or dre dress fitters, those, those that really can't social distance, or, or just wondering how they square the circle of maintaining that distance while also trying to get back to business. Yeah, and, and I think I think it's a very it's a very very good question, and and um, I think open. I think up until fairly recently, and in, in, in honestly, a, a lot of businesses were not turning their mind to reopening. I think it is only in, in, in more recent times as it appears that we are past the peak and um, the measures that have been put in place are, are working. Um, that, and with obviously talk um, south of the border and from the Prime Minister about um, <laughs> opening up economies again, that businesses are thinking in this way. and, and um, that then is posing a lot of questions, and that's where you know I, I think uh, Gordon's point from earlier is is incredibly valid that you can't be too rigid um, because mm -hmm. that you know a very rigid set of guidelines will not work in every single set of circumstances, and people have to use some degree of of, of sense around all of this. Um, but you know I, I do think that there are I would I would distinguish between businesses who because of their scale perhaps have the capacity in house um, or across a group. Um, to offer advice down to individual branches or offices or whatever it might be. But there are a lot of um, independent retailers, independent businesses, small businesses spread right across Northern Ireland who um, will be looking for advice um, and looking for guidance. And you know, to date, we haven't, um, as an organisation, had any contact from the Health and Safety Executive about it and to say that individual members haven't been in contact or, or contacted. But I do think that it is now, as we move towards getting going again, and not it's not quite a business as usual, but some business, um, then I think that, that just having that ability to ask for advice, um, I think would be incredibly useful, even if it isn't rigidly handed down on that from, from on high. Thank you. Very, yeah. Thank you. Gary? Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks uh, to, to everyone on the line. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to put on record um, my thanks and, and certainly no doubt all of our thanks uh, for the leadership that the Chambers have shown, uh, particularly uh, in getting uh, the Assembly back up and running. I know particularly the London Chamber was particularly vocal uh, from our perspective, uh, and also ensuring that um, the businesses' voices are heard during this very difficult situation. So thank you for that. Uh, it's very clear that there's quite a few common threads that, that you've all been speaking to, uh, and I hear those concerns, uh, particularly around the communication, the coordination piece. Um, we all know that um, you know in, in these times that the, the political ideologies and all of that need to be set aside. We need to ensure that our businesses, whether it's north, south, east or west, that they're uh, communicating and we're, we're, we're trying to get our people uh, back to work as best as possible. Um, obviously, you, you welcome the current schemes and, and no doubt there were gaps, given the fact that the Minister did state that the aim was to get as much money and financial support out as quickly as possible. Uh, inevitably, there were going to be people who were going to fall through uh, 
the cracks, but that's where we need to now uh, ensure that those people are picked up again. Uh, you, you've touched on a number of the initiatives which could be looked at, rates relief being one of them. Uh, I suppose uh, my question would be that, you know, given that all of these things are very much time, time sensitive and, and we're now looking to the recovery phase, could you maybe outline, even if it was one specific thing that could be done uh, very much immediately that, that the minister could, could look at that would be uh, of, uh, of support to, to as wide a grouping as possible? I think if I, if I could kick off here, I mean, yeah, uh, I've sort of, uh, uh, asked being allowed to say two things as opposed to one thing. And um, when I mentioned earlier, I think the, the furlough scheme has been vitally important to, uh, I suppose, allowing business to be put into cold storage and protecting employment. And as we come out of this um, lockdown, I, I think some form of extension of the furlough or, as Simon said earlier, a flexible approach to furlough uh, would be would be vital uh, because businesses will be starting at a different scale than what they were in March. Uh, many of them will be trying to rebuild their market share, so they'll not be in a profit scenario. So if they could uh, extend the furlough scheme to help and also bring in an element of flexibility to it so that if somebody wanted to bring somebody in for a couple of days a week as opposed to you know five days a week, uh, that, that would be helpful as well. And uh, I think you touched on rate support as well. If there is some form of targeted uh, um, support, uh, I'm particularly thinking here of the hospitality and retail sector who, who will be facing quite a significant uh, challenge in the coming months, probably right through to the autumn. Uh, until they can start to, to open up again and start to look to, to a more positive future next year. I, I think continuing support for rates, uh, business rates relief for those businesses that are either uh, working at a significantly reduced capacity or perhaps still closed. Thanks very much. Um, John, I, I, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say there and, uh, re and uh, reinforce what Colin was saying about the furlough scheme. I mean, a lot of businesses now are considering how many people they'll take back and at what time. And they really do need to know as soon as possible uh, what, what supports will be in place be before they make those uh, very important decisions. Because if they don't, unfortunately, they could end up on, on, you know, being made redundant. So it's really critical that information comes now, along with the phase plan as well of reopening, because uh, certainly that gives a lot of hope. It gives a lot of uh, confidence. And it will encourage people, you know, there is an end to this. And I think it will, you know, will be very, very beneficial if we get that as well. Thank you. Um, John O'Dowd? Um, can you hear me, Chair? Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, and thank you to uh, all the witnesses today. It's been a very informative discussion, an enlightening discussion around how uh, the various <coughs> members of commerce, etc., have been investigating how they, how they reopen their businesses again and I have to say in a very practical way and I am very reassured by the constant references uh, to the safety of the public uh, to, to staff and, and customers uh, through their premises because I, I was just looking at the headline from yesterday in relation to the health minister and Mr Swan Minister Swan who, who's concerned that the debate around the lockdown is getting ahead of itself and uh, everything we discuss has to be put in that context that it has to be on the basis of a safe return to business uh, and it's in that context I, I'm putting my points to you I, I know Simon had referred to the need to for, for want of a better term police how uh, queues etc are, are managed on, on footpaths and pavements in, in busy shopping areas etc uh, and that, that is a, that's a question I, it's a relevant question they need answered I also note but there has been some priority plans put to, together, uh, and if those could be shared with, with the committee, if, if that's appropriate, then I think that would be very useful. But what other measures, and I mentioned this to a number of groups last week, we have seen attempts to manage the cash flow of businesses, but now as we move towards the safe reopening of businesses, what other practical measures are, do we need to look at as an executive and support of businesses? Uh, I, last week I referred to the need for PPE. Now, and that has to be put into context. I'm not referring to medical grade PPE. I'm referring to, for instance, uh, staff uniform. Do, do we need to support businesses in terms of providing uh, more staff uniform uh, in terms of self-isolating the first back screens? Uh, somebody had mentioned the hairdressers. Is there case studies 
for each individual business sector or have case studies started in the, in the business sector as to how we allow them to reopen safely going towards the future. Thank you. I think, Chair, that those are, you know, very good points that John has, has made. And, and, you know, on the, on the high level point around the context in which we find ourselves in, that, you know, you, hopefully you'll, you'll know too that, that in anything that, that we have said individually or, or collectively, it hasn't been demanding that the economy reopens or fully or, or that a date, a firm date is set. Everything has to be guided by the science and the reality of the, the health situation. But this is a very much a, a health emergency, which has then created an economic emergency. And the two are now very much interlinked. And I, I don't think it is, I don't think it is, is wrong in any way as we move um, through and beyond peak that we start thinking about how we reopen again and that's exactly what your your, your questions are, are getting at um i think we've you know we, we are still to some extent in the rescue phase for a lot of businesses but there is an overlap in terms of kind of pre-recovery uh, and in certain sectors how they prepare for uh, opening up again gradually and in a phased way um before we move into hopefully a a, a recovery uh, at some point later in, in the year um i think that there's you know one of the one of the, um, I, I hate to use the word benefits, but you know, one of the, I think the the lessons that we can learn from from elsewhere, given that where we are here in terms of the impact of COVID nineteen uh, and other other countries, in particularly in Europe, is that you know we can look to them and learn lessons from how they are reopening. I know that, that many of our members have um, premises, offices, uh, shops, whatever it might be in those states and, and we can look and, and learn from, from what they are doing and I know that that is actually what is being done in many cases. Um, I think your, your point around the wearing or use of PP is an interesting one. Um, it doesn't seem to be what is happening in other European states um, to any sort of huge great degree. Um, it seems to be much more about uh, queuing, spacing, um, layouts, um, of, of shops and premises being uh, rejigged, um, policies in place in terms of the return of goods uh, and things like that, rather than sort of you know people coming into stores putting on some PPE and being served by people who are in um, wearing masks or, or or gowns or whatever it might be. Um, I think if I mean there is a bit of a I suppose a fear that if, if we get into that type of thing, it it, it, it fundamentally changes. If you think of retail, very very much changes the retail or hospitality experience if that's what you're met with, uh, and maybe maybe somewhat off-putting and therefore not good for business, and maybe detrimental then to be open in those sorts of environments. But you're right that the the overriding guiding principle around all of this is that it is done safely, uh, and I haven't spoken to a single business owner who wants to open up in a way that isn't safe both for for the, themselves and their staff, um, uh, and also for the customers, and they know that unless there is safety then there won't be confidence for people to come in and their business will not succeed. John, maybe if I could add uh, another point. One of your, your questions was about what could the executive do? And I know we've talked about rates and, and other initiatives, uh, but the government is a, is a major purchaser in the economy. And I think, and then Karen touched on it earlier, we could look at uh, the public procurement uh, process, the entering process and see if it can be done uh, more quickly and, and in a targeted way that would help to support uh, to support the local economy and also the payment system at the end of that so that, that people get paid quickly because one of the issue that uh, issues that our, our survey is showing is you know insurance debtors so it's about the movement of, of money quickly around uh, around the economy particularly to, to small businesses and subcontractors and I think the government has uh, and the executive has a significant role to play in that. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, th thank you for those responses. And as I said, it's been a very useful engagement. Um, I, I find it particularly useful. Uh, and as I say, if there is uh, case studies or, or plans that you can share with the committee, I, I think that would also be very useful because as we move forward, uh, I think the more information we have and the more informed debate uh, moving forward, I think it will allow businesses to open up safely. Uh, much more quickly. Um, so thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your answers so far. It's all been very informative. Uh, I want to make just sort of one observation and then a few specific questions.
questions. Firstly, I think it's absolutely right to say that our government here uh, needs to be producing a broad outline of how we're going to get back to normal and get out of lockdown, because I do think genuinely that fatigue is starting to set in in the public. And you only have to, you only have to look at the rules around Belfast uh, to see that where there is definitely, I sense, and this is purely anecdotal, but I definitely sense an increase in the amount of movement that's taking place. So I think lockdown is, um, is important, obviously, and uh, should be abided by, but I think more people will abide by it if they get a sense of when it will end. Um, so that's just my observation. My, my two questions specifically, one of the very few positive things that um, I have noticed that has come out of uh, this situation is an increase in people using local shops, butchers, bakers, fruit shops and stuff like that rather than big supermarkets. I'm just wondering how do we build on that goodwill coming out of this to encourage more of that type of, of shopping? And then I suppose this, this question is specifically for uh, Simon Hamilton. The city deal uh, in Belfast, obviously a, a massive undertaking and very welcome investment in the city. In terms of the impact that this situation has had, what, what's your assessment of that on the delivery of the city deal? And how do you see uh, long-term recovery and expansion of Belfast? Because, as, as you say, ultimately what's good for Belfast is good for all of Northern Ireland. Can, can I just jump in on the, on the first part of that question around the, um, the sort of the shop local? Yes. Um, did, did, I'm sure everybody was aware, um, was, I don't know, it was yesterday or the day before, um, the um, Prime Minister of New Zealand talking about having a bubble. Um, and people only being able to travel in certain areas. I, I do think that, you know, we have an opportunity to, um, you know, without being too, um, what's the word, uh, sort of, you know, too strict or, you know, too, um, uh, um, I can't think of the word, but ultimately I think that that's, yes, I think that support for local business is crucial. And I do think that, that there is um, a sort of a sea change from people. I think the fact that, you know, the PPE that was mentioned, that we've had to wait for it to come from overseas. The whole idea of onshoring or nearshoring, generally, I think is something that um, it would be amazing to, to grab the opportunity and really um, support not just the local businesses that are in that food sector, but in all businesses that are trying to, to grow. Because um, as, a, as a global economy, we've, we've looked elsewhere for a long time, and I think um, I think you're absolutely right. That's really, really important and crucial to the to the recovery. And the other thing I'd just like to add there, if I could, um, in relation to you know people shopping more local, certainly some of our members are concerned about the move to online, and um, you know there is a real sense that they could lose a lot of their their uh, local business because of the the move to online. So it's really encouraging people to try and get back into the safe safe environments and again that's that kind of marketing campaign shop shop local um, you know people are making the effort to try and make it as safe as possible for you please come back and in relation to innovation as well i mean we've seen people like the wall city brewery in Derry making hand sanitizer and no meals which is well documented yeah. and there's no doubt there's opportunities there for northern ireland uh, to to uh that's current first on that you know to that we source locally we source these products locally for so you know Safety of supply, uh, I think, is really important as well as come out of this. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the, it is one of the, the more encouraging aspects of, of the awful situation that we find ourselves in, that, is, is that many businesses have innovated to deal with the circumstances that they find, find themselves in, and whether that is manufacturers um, adopting their, their output to produce um, PPE or, or uh, material to help the, the NHS, or restaurants or cafe converting to takeaway services and so forth i think it has been it has been encouraging um paul is right though that there is a you know there is a particularly in the retail sector there's a bit of a, a an increase in in the threat to high street city center town center retail which is that um for many products you know that there has been a, a shift towards um online purchasing and you know this this is because this this has gone on for an extended period of time 
that has perhaps for some people moved from a bit of a novelty to something that they're going to do as, as, a, as a habit moving forward and, and, and that, that will put pressure on an already under pressure um, retail sector in, in, in many of our towns and cities. Um, on, on the specific point around, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good point to raise around, and I, I don't think that, and maybe it, it feels something a little bit too early, but I don't think that we should be ignoring the need to also work on a long-term recovery plan, and that's why I think all of us were, were really appreciative because all of our areas and businesses within those areas, the people in those areas will benefit from the city deals and the growth deals that, that were match funded by the executive earlier this week. So, you know, I think that that, that sent out a, a very encouraging signal that not only was the executive thinking about rescue, but was also focusing on recovery too. And I, I, I think my, my view around the city deals is that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a temptation at times like this to kind of look for lots of new big ideas. But the, the truth is that, you know, we have already done a lot of that work in producing the city deals and the growth deals and, and the things that are included within those, I know, particularly in Belfast, they they are true now, as true now as they were before this crisis, and they will be absolutely true and right and proper for the growth of our economy beyond this crisis as well. So investing in universities and colleges so that they produce the, the skilled workers and the talent that attracts investment uh, and can grow the city is hugely important, but also that focus on innovation and, and research. And, and that's the sort of work that bolsters that tech sector, which has actually been quite resilient by and large throughout this crisis, um, and is world class and can continue to grow and be world class. And, and I think that you know, for a lot of our, a lot of our areas in uh, Belfast in particular, with you know, we're looking to the Department of Finance at the moment, or the Department for the Economy for support in terms of of, of rescue. Um, and we will continue to look to, to those departments around issues like connectivity um, and the importance of that. There's a lot of work as well for, for departments like infrastructure and communities. You know, so how we move around Belfast, how we move across the region is incredibly important. And a particular one that's relevant to the city is how do we get more people living in Belfast city centre? Um, that's something for the Department of Communities to think about. So recovery isn't just going to be a department for the economy issue. It's also it's going to be right across the executive. Um, and many of those departments who are maybe less in the front line today will be very much in the front line in terms of recovering. Thank you. I maybe just touch on, on the Belfast region city here because New Newry is part of that, but Simon is right that the city and, and the growth deals are, are, are going to be beneficial right across North Ireland. And I think it touches on the earlier point that I, I made to, to John about the government's role uh, as a major investment investor in the economy in terms of contracts. And if you look at some of the schemes in, in our area, the Southern Lake Road, the, the Morn uh, Visitor Destination Project, and the investment in public realm, they're all uh, you know, in the process, in the pipeline. They will all create jobs in, in construction and during the building process, and then impact in the long term in, in creating employment in the economy. And so they, they, they're vitally important, as Simon said, Many of them already uh, have started work in terms of the preparation, so that will be vital to to the recovery plan that's being put in place. Thank you. Hello, hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you very much to uh, Paul, Colin, Simon, and Karen. It has been uh, a, a really good briefing. Um, we are definitely uh, living in very strange times. Um, but it is right and appropriate that we should be thinking, you know, what, what's the next phase? But the next phase is going to be extremely challenging. Um, and we need to make sure that the executives are, are very transparent in, in, in the game plan coming forward. But there, there, there are two issues that I would just kind of like to touch on. Uh, and one is, you know, I've been speaking to... to um, uh, Richard Ramsey uh, from, from Ulster Bank in relation to just the economic outlook. Uh, and one of the big issues coming forward um, will be um, our young people. Uh, and there's a projection that we could have 25% um, unemployment rate among our young people. Uh, and this is a group that has had um, a setback whenever we had the banking crisis as well. Uh, and, and particularly people, maybe new entrants coming into the job market. And I'm just wondering, you know, as uh, Chief Executive of, of the Chambers of Commerce throughout uh, Northern Ireland, um, will you be given some thought into how maybe you can support young people um, getting to work and getting in maybe apprenticeship 
or things like that. So that's the first question. And then the second question is, um, uh, you know, um, th this uh, particular crisis hasn't hit everybody evenly. Um, a, a lot of people have been left behind because um, their businesses or, or, or their, their method of working uh, depended on very good, strong broadband. And some of, of, of people or businesses, particularly in rural areas, have been hit hard by this. Have, have, have you heard that from, from, from your members? Uh, and, and how might we support them um, going forward? Maybe if I could kick off um, in, in terms of you, your first question about, about young people, you're correct that that often that that's young people uh, that that lose out first and heard of some that the apprenticeships uh, being being terminated. But um, we have a very strong relationship at at our local level uh, with the education sector, and I mentioned that uh, in my uh, original uh, presentation at the start, and in particular with the, the Southern Regional College, and and that relationship has allowed. Uh, the college to deliver to the business community young people with the skills uh, needed uh, for, for business and I think that's what is needed as we move forward that we've got to ensure that there is that continued investment by the executive in the in the schools and college network so that we have so that young people are supported that they have the skills that they have the skills that are needed and that the skills that businesses want want to use so I think I think that that is that that is vital. Um, and, and your second question I think was about about people uh, being being left behind. Um, it's, it's it's a challenging one in the sense that um, I, I I see the the furlough scheme as, as being important in in that respect. That quite often when there's an e economic downturn, it's maybe those that are less well off uh, who, um, who who tend not to to who tend for more. In the sense of being made unemployed, so if we can keep the furlough scheme going for a longer period of time and in a more flexible way, I think that will protect uh, protect employment. Um, yeah, if, uh, sorry, yeah, I'm just going to jump in. In, in. in terms of the um, in terms of young people, Sinead, I um, yeah, I completely agree, and I think that um, as Colin said, I, I think across the, the chamber network, certainly we would be the same in terms of our um, relationship with the with the colleges. And the businesses over the last number of years have been um, working quite closely on the, the apprenticeship scheme. I think one of the things for in, in our local area that has been really um, impressive has been when there's been a demand for, um, for example, in our area, Armstrong Medical, obviously, um, you know, they've pretty much, I think, um, sort of doubled their production. It's been the young people that have stepped up and taken you know those jobs um and also over in um in mahara block lines with similar so there's been a real sort of um for me a real like value-based um decisions made by these um young people and i do hope that um you know once we come a bit further through this that there's some you know some form of recognition and that because i think there will need to be a bit of a resetting around what the um local um economies look like and for us you know, normally a lot of the young people up here would be getting summer jobs and we don't know what that looks like so it's certainly something that's been a big topic for us in, in within our um chamber conversations and i'm not suggesting we've got the answers yet but it's, we're very aware of it in terms of connectivity around broadband completely agree um for us it is still um it is still an issue for some of the more um rural uh rural businesses and i think but I think I assume it's an issue across, you know, nearly the globe in the UK because I know Sky went down a few weeks ago. I know two had a problem yesterday. So we, we certainly need to ramp up um, our um, our broadband connectivity across the whole of um, of Northern Ireland. I would suggest. Hello. Uh, our our um, our our biggest advantage is, as an economy before this crisis, and, and it will be the same afterwards, is the ability of our region to, to produce talented skilled workers that, that businesses need um, and that has been the secret to, to our success over the last number of years and, and will continue to be so I believe and, and many of our members it's about Sinead's question the likes of uh, Deloitte and Fintru and many many others have been at the forefront of driving forward sort of modern apprenticeships higher level apprenticeships um, and using the skills academies to, to get those staff that they need to, to be competitive and to be successful globally. <laughs> uh, and I think that they will continue to step forward um, because if they don't have that talented lab, uh, labour pool, then 
um, it makes them less competitive and, and you know they, they will not be able to compete um, globally on the telecoms issue. I mean, we, uh, Belfast, Cham Belfast Chamber doesn't have um, um, a huge amount of rural areas. Uh, rural for Belfast Chamber would be more or less where, where Mr. Dunn lives. Um, um, so, 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 so broadband has been actually incredibly important, um, um, and the, 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 the telecom system that we have, and the investments that have been made, have actually helped the resilience of the tech sector, in, in particular during um, this crisis. I've spoken to many who have been able to work from home um, because of the strength of our telecoms network. Um, uh, whereas competitors elsewhere in the globe haven't been able to uh, work from home. But I think regardless of whether it's urban or rural, continuing to invest in telecoms along with continuing to invest in skills is a hugely important for the growth of this economy moving forward. Thank, thank you. Can I make just one other observation before um, I leave this? Um, I, I would concur with, with both Paul and, and Colm that we need a joined up approach between um, north and south in, uh, in relation to getting out of lockdown. It's incredibly important, particularly for the tourism sector uh, and particularly for cross-border workers, uh, and we feel it very, very strongly here in the North West. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for your, for your input. It's been really, really useful to us, and I think we will um, try to work out how best we can continue the, the dialogue and the input, because it, um, and particularly in relation to planning for for reopening, the points are well made about this being a health emergency and that guiding how we move forward. Um, but we do need to try and move, get a plan in place for how we do that safely. And I know the executive is obviously working on that framework as well. So thank you again for being with us this morning. Chair, if, if thank I can, thank you. If I can just uh, step in at that point. Thank you to the chambers. Um, we're running a bit late, so I'm aware. Um, Health and Safety Executive have been on the line for quite a while, and apologies to them for that. I suspect we may also now have been joined by insolvency. I'll, I'll apologise in advance to insolvency. Um, I'm still getting used to management of times on this. So insolvency, we're going to go ahead with, with Health and Safety Executive, because they were scheduled first. But if you can hang on for us, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. If you keep your, um, If you stay on mute... While we, while we talk to the Health and Safety Executive, that will mean there is not feedback. And, and my apologies again. As I say, time management on this has been very complex. So if we go ahead, Chair, with, with Health and Safety Executive. Thank you. And, and my apologies also for keeping people waiting. Um, on the line this morning, we have Robert Kidd, who is Chief Executive of the Health and Safety Executive. Brian Monson, and who is head of Health and Safety Executive Field Operations Division, and Nikki Monson, who is head of Specialist Sectors Division. Um, there is a clerk memo for members at page 24 of your pack, and if um, the the officials would like to make an opening statement, and then we'll open up to members. Good morning, Chair. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Morning. Um, I'm Robert Kidd, the Chief Executive. Uh, if I can just open, I'm going to cover the opening statement, and then I have Brian and Nikki as my experts, so they'll help me with the, the tough questions. Uh, can I first thank everyone for the invitation to join with you this morning? Uh, I'm going to just touch on a couple of things very briefly, and then move very quickly to the focus, and, and I'm sure members' interests are predominantly around the current coronavirus crisis. So just by way of a little bit of background, I know we've been planning to try and get a briefing session um, set up with committee, but unfortunately we were overtaken by events, so apologies for that. Um, the Health and Safety Executive was formed in 1999. We are a non-departmental public body with Crown status, so effectively all of our staff are civil servants. Uh, we are overseeing, we have an affiliation with the Department of the Economy, uh, however we also have a management board. Um, that's, that's the bit of background just on, on the organization itself. HNCNI's primary function is one of protection. This involves protection of employees in the workplace and others who may be affected by work activities, be it their safety or physical health or mental health. It provides for the protection of the economy. Fully managed health and safety duties have an enormous cost and an impact on the economy. Health and safety executive Northern Ireland has powers of enforcement by virtue of the Health and Safety at Work 
Northern Ireland Order 1978, which includes the powers to serve prohibition notices. These powers are to be used against health and safety risks created as a direct result of work activity under the employer's control. District councils also have the same powers under the order, albeit for premises such as shops and offices. An employer has a statutory duty to manage and control the risks he or she creates to as low a level as possible based on a cost and practicability basis. Health and safety guidance is available on how to do this for employers. Moving on then to COVID-19. COVID-19 is a public health issue existing in the general population and not created as a result of a direct work activity. However, an employer has an overarching duty to ensure people's health and safety while they are in the work environment. Right from the beginning, health and safety executives in Northern Ireland looked at the contribution to this new public health dilemma by virtue of its own skills and abilities, balanced alongside the need to protect and to look after its own staff. The organisation recognised the role it has as an enforcer in ensuring a healthy and safe working environment, even as a result of a public health risk. In this unprecedented time, it is a logical step for an employer uh, that their duty also encompasses the need to keep employees safe insofar as is reasonably possible from the possibility of contracting COVID-19 while in the workplace. This can only be achieved by following the public health guidelines on social distancing and good hygiene. HSENI had no more guidance than anyone else on this, other than that which was publicly available um, really in the last seven weeks. The concept of social distancing and public health guidance was entirely new, and from day one, our staff were put on a steep learning curve with no training and the challenge to seek to apply it to how people could be kept safe in the workplace. The staff were faced with a difficult issue alongside other businesses who were allowed to remain open of interpreting what it actually meant to adhere to the new guidance in day-to-day -day operations. This interpretation was especially difficult in the area of social distancing, where the guidance states two metres to be maintained where possible. We ran to meet the problem head on rather than trying to avoid it. We were, however, all too well aware of our limitations, considering that this was public health guidance and not something which our staff were familiar with. We were also aware of the unique position we hold as enforcers in ensuring that employers are keeping people healthy and safe in their workplaces. We recognise the need to work alongside others, trade unions, employers, employer and industry representative groups, looking at how these new requirements could be built into a risk assessment model. There was no off-the-shelf solution available. In compliance with public health guidelines, we looked at what and how we could best deliver a service to the public, albeit on a limited and a constantly learning basis. Critical to that role was the need for people to gain access to us as a trusted source of information and advice, along with our remit for investigating complaints. Setting up a service wasn't without its IT challenges, as we set out to deliver a forward-facing service with all staff working from home. Our business continuity planning helped us in the initial and early days. We could provide for this unprecedented challenge. Our business continuity plan had never anticipated that we would have all staff suddenly working from 114 different locations. Early on in the lockdown, HSE and I defined how it was going to respond. This involved inspectors answering all ranges of queries and drafting and sharing of frequently asked questions that could help assist businesses with the interpretation of the public health guidelines. Advice was revised as public health agency advice was updated and changed. HSENI also defined areas that required field visits to be carried out, such as responding to reports of fatalities or issues of serious concern. We had one such incident in the early weeks, which involved an overturn of a crane and a serious incident, uh, which also involved the dispatch of an air ambulance. We attended the scene to ensure there was no ongoing danger. Uh, and just this week, we also heard reports um, and HSE attended the scene of a scaffolding collapse in East Belfast. I'm very pleased by how my staff have adapted to this new and challenging working environment. We stand in awe, and rightly so, of those on the front line who are caring for those in need, and we're trying to offer our support, and I would like to pay tribute to the work that they do. 
but also want to know that my staff are working extremely hard to try and maintain this public service uh, in what is a very changing uh, and fluid environment. Since the start of lockdown on Monday the 16th of March until May the 4th, HSENI received 991 complaints. We investigated 666 and passed a further 325 to other enforcing authorities. Those were predominantly for local authority. I believe that the ability of a concerned employer or employee to speak to someone who is a qualified inspector and to ensure that the matters are dealt with as soon as possible is of great reassurance to people. Staff have worked tirelessly with other stakeholders to interpret for the workplace the guidance on social distancing. We've worked hard to identify ways of mitigating the risks to keep people safe in, in the workplace, no matter what jobs they do. This is particularly evident in the food processing industry, where the challenges of the public health guidelines without sensible interpretation could have meant closure of essential food production in Northern Ireland. This was a very real concern in the early days. From the outset, the majority of employers acknowledged the need to make changes in the workplace if they wanted to continue to operate. HSENI and industry bodies came together to offer ideas on how social distancing could be facilitated and what mitigations might be considered where the two metre distance was not readily achievable. Both the food processing industry and the manufacturing sector have seen significant and rapid investment to bring about changes in order to protect the health of their staff. Changes have included both revisions to routines and processes, as well as physical works, such as the installation of perspex screens, extending workspaces and packing lines, reworking layouts in certain areas where this was feasible. There are simple changes, such as staggering start times to reduce pedestrian flows from car parks and through uh, clock-in areas and changing facilities, to staggered break times or use of additional spaces uh, for lunch times and other um, break times has also helped space staff out. The use of peer signage and regular reminders to staff of the need to adhere to social distancing policy at all times has also helped cement these changes within the workplaces. The work continues to this day. I've been hugely impressed by how the food processing industry in particular have worked together to implement changes and to share good practice. Similar sharing is now filtering through uh, from the manufacturing sector which was slightly behind because food processing was kind of operating from day one. Enforcement has been a challenge in light of the application of public health guidance. However, an employer's duty to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare at work of all its employees is clear in law. This includes the provision of systems of work that are, so far as reasonably practicable, safe and without risk to health. HSC and I stands ready to serve prohibition notices in this regard, where employers are failing to take the necessary action to follow the requirements of the public health guidelines. It should also be said that employees have a duty to comply with the requirements of the guidelines, including social distancing. We've seen this in the workplace where systems have been put in place, but occasionally employees do not follow them. But then, while this may require employers to increase levels of supervision, take disciplinary action where necessary, employees should be aware that they too have a legal duty to comply with measures put in place for their safety. Undoubtedly, we are dealing with a challenge to change human behaviours in order to ensure the safety of everyone. We've been asked questions about the need to take a more rigorous stance on enforcement and to serve notices that could potentially close businesses down. The first thing, and I would make this very clear, is that HSENI do not have powers which extend to closing businesses down. It should also be said that HSENI does not have the power to decide which businesses should open and which should close. We have received a number of queries in light of the confusion people have in this area. There have been many questions raised on the subject of PPE and its use in relation to COVID-19. Current public health guidance indicates that it should be used primarily in the healthcare setting and comprehensive guidance already available on this. While there is clearly much discussion and indeed confusion over the use of PPE related to COVID-19, HSENI must follow current government guidelines when providing advice in this area. HSENI did not have the support of its co-enforcer, HSEGB, at the start of lockdown, 
as they had a more limited involvement. However, we are now working very closely with them, where at all possible. We have also ensured effective liaison with our colleagues in the Health and Safety Authority in the Republic of Ireland, and it has been notable that our counterparts in GB and the Republic have taken a similar stance to many of our early actions in relation to their own working methods. HSE and I have also worked with Employee Engagement Forum. Uh, this is the LRA chaired forum set up by the executive. Uh, and we've assisted in the development of the Northern Ireland guidance, which is for the support of industry and trade unions. The experience of the mental health, sorry, the experience of the mental well-being and work advisory service to the HSE and I, which looks at the importance of managing work-related stress, has already been offered in support of the future role of a mental health champion proposed by the Department of Health. There is now more reason than ever to look at the impact of COVID-19 and what it will do in increasing work-related stress. So challenges in learning. Needless to say, there will be a time for us all to reflect on our learning from these unprecedented times. While that time may not yet be here, I'd like to make a few observations. I hope committee members will lend their support where you're in agreement with me. There's a need for a clear, unambiguous guidance to reduce misunderstanding. Certain key terminology has been introduced alongside statutory terms and often used interchangeably with other terms, which cause later confusion in the understanding and application of guidance. There is a need for early engagement and thereby shared understanding. This is alongside the need for a flexible approach to allow solutions to be identified to complex problems across all stakeholders, including other government departments and representative bodies. There is a need for government departments to work together operationally to see how they can best assist each other, identify positions of strength, and the communication of joint messaging with key stakeholders. Many issues are cross-cutting, and we engage with colleagues in DFE, DFI, DERA, DOH, and TU. There is a need for early identification lead key partners who others need intelligence from. This needs to be established with formal streams of communication between relevant parties, taking account of resource constraints. In the past weeks, I've ensured that all of my staff have access to mobile uh, IT devices to permit uh, working from home. Staff have adapted to this very readily, uh, and we're probably very fortunate because we come from an environment where many of our staff were already mobile uh, before the coronavirus crisis struck. So looking forward, our corporate plan sets out the targets across all areas of HSENI's work. The corporate plan covers the period from 2018 to 2023. The focus of the plan is on preventing and dealing with the most serious injuries in the most challenging sectors. We have the draft operating plan for 20, so 2020 to 2021 year. This was drafted in late January. We're now starting a process of reviewing it so it more closely reflects the impact of COVID-19 across all of our business areas. In recent days, there's been much talk of businesses preparing to get back to work. Some of the larger firms uh, have met, been mentioned in the media, along with the construction sector. The experience of others in looking at how they can comply with public health guidelines will no doubt have been a benefit to these companies now seeking to return to work, allowing many of the businesses put in place social distancing policies and measures in advance of actually bringing staff back into the workplace. Evidence would also suggest that many of these companies are resuming work on a phased approach, which allows the testing of measures which they have in place. In construction, the Construction Leadership Council has issued guidance, as has the Construction Employers Federation in Northern Ireland, to ensure that those in the construction industry are protected regardless of the type of construction activity that they engage in. The Mineral Products Association for Northern Ireland has also issued guidance and worked with many of their members to make and implement changes. There is always a degree of risk in everything that people do in the workplace. In complying with their duties to provide a safe place of work, employers need to risk assess the work environment to determine how they can comply with public health guidance. COVID-19 is now a risk brought from outside into the workplace, and that still needs to be managed. HSE and I will provide as much advice and guidance to employers as it can on this. It is therefore essential that an employer complies 
with their duty to determine if work activities meet the public health guidelines and to continue to apply it to go on operating. HSE and I will continue to encourage employers where they encounter a situation at work which they feel is within a group. Sorry, we encourage employees where they feel they encounter a situation at work which puts them at risk. They should first raise it within the organization and if they remain unhappy with the response, they can contact the health and safety executive with their complaint. The advice and contact details are on our website and that can be done by way of an online web form. They can email us or they can contact us through our helpline. I want to be clear that HSE and I is not the policy maker around COVID-19. That is very much the domain of the public health authorities. However, HSE as an organization stands ready to play its part in ensuring that the workplace has access to health and safety expertise to look at what additional measures can be applied so far as is reasonable to comply with these public health guidelines. For reasonable action has not been taken, we look at a range of compliance options open to us and take the necessary action regard employees. HSE and I's workload and priorities have changed their focus very significantly in the last seven weeks, but we continue to fulfill our duty and to do as our strap line says on our logo, we're controlling risk together. Um, so that's really all I'm going to say by way of introduction, and I'm happy uh, to try and take questions along with my colleague Brian and Nicky. very comprehensive overview. Um, there are many questions coming coming out of it and it has been very, very helpful to us. Um, I'm going to pick up on a, on a couple of things myself and then open up to, to members. Um, in relation to the, I suppose, coordination with the, the, um, the, the public health authorities, um, the department and trade unions, the, the LRA-led forum um, obviously was put in place to, to, for example, put in place the, the guidance and, and that has been published. Uh, one of the things that we have been picking up on and that you have referenced there yourself is, I suppose, the need for sectoral guidance to, um, for you know, particular business types and how, how they can best put in place um, what is needed to, to protect employees, customers, um, et cetera. Um, is, do you work alongside those um, representative bodies to, to support the guidance that they are putting in place? Um, is one of the questions um, in relation to the, the powers that you have in terms of the, of the prohibition, you've clarified one of my questions around it, which is whether you have the ability to um, issue prohibition it, and notices on the restrictions. Um, and I, I'm, if I'm interpreting correctly, yes, you do. Um, and <coughs> what um, what are what are the nature of the prohibition um, notices that are being put in place or are being issued? And um, and then a further question is around resources. Um, obviously, and I know because I have contacted you myself, um, and, and I know a number of colleagues have as well. And I just like to put on record my my thanks as well in terms of the the quick responses that I have had from yourselves in relation to, to queries that I have made. But in terms of the staff and resources um, that, you, that you have and are able to direct, direct um, what pressures are you facing in relation to that? I know that's a, a lot of questions at you in one go. But... Hey, sure, I'll, I'll kick off. And, um, I'll, I'll let Brian and Nikki then just come in as well if there's anything that I missed. In terms of sectoral specific advice, uh, I, I mentioned very specifically there um, the, the construction industry obviously as one of the industry groups which is proposing uh, and is actually starting to return to work. Um, there has been a great deal done. Um, we've had a huge amount of learning just out of the last seven weeks. I think in the early days, working alongside the likes of the food manufacturing and processing industry, we were all learning. There were lots of questions which we all had. Um, but we've learned a huge amount from that in terms of what can be done, both for physical changes within the workplace, and then some process and procedural changes. A lot of those things are very generic issues which can be applied across a broad spectrum of work areas. Um, there are some very specific and very challenging questions that have arisen in relation to particular um, sectors and industries. And I say we are not public health experts. We're not virologists. We don't have epidemi epidemiologists in our staffing. Uh, so we're putting a lot of those questions back to public health colleagues 
uh, and asking them to consider very specific advice to support particular sectors. Where we can, um, we will apply obviously the, the guidance, uh, but that's, I think it's fair to say that there are very specific questions. There are a number of, of businesses, and it's been talked about in the media in the last couple of days. Some people have said there are certain businesses which are not compatible with social distancing. And some of the examples around that, obviously, we've all heard in the media in the last 24 hours about air travel, um, hairdressing, taxis, restaurants, social venues. There are lots of challenges for us as we look to the future and opening certain businesses up. That's a hard thing for people, both the employer and their customers and the employees see it. So there are some very real challenges there for us. In terms of working with partnership bodies, we've had a really strong relationship and certainly I know in the last uh, five, six weeks, I've had more contact um, with trade bodies and union reps probably than in the previous year. Uh, we've worked very closely with colleagues, manufacturing NI, various of small businesses, um, the unions, Unite, Unison, um, the unions have been really supportive and worked very closely with us, um, keeping us informed uh, and talking to the members as well. So that has been has been hugely beneficial. In terms of prohibition notices, um, we would serve a prohibition notice on a specific area uh, of activity. So if there was a, a process which was immediately dangerous, and I'll, I'm going to leave that to my experts to say more on, um, really where something is deemed to be immediately dangerous, we can serve a prohibition notice which stops the activity. Our preferred method, uh, and indeed, as, as we've seen in recent weeks with PSNI, what we need for these industries to continue to operate is about engagement. It's about working alongside them. It's about educating them and providing solutions rather than stepping in and saying, right, we're serving a prohibition notice. Now you go and sort this out yourself. The industry bodies and the employers have been hugely uh, willing to engage because I think now businesses are brought in, businesses realize that social distancing is with us for some time. And they, knew, they know that this is not just a short term fix that they need to put in place for 10, 12 weeks. This is, this is longer term and it's about business survival uh, in order to allow them to operate. Uh, Nikki Monson here, uh, Chair, could I just come in on the subject of, of the prohibition notices, please, in relation to those questions. As Robert had mentioned in his opening brief, um, normally where we serve and this is to do with the hazard that is created within the workplace. This is a very unusual circumstance in the sense that it is a, a public health hazard, as we are aware of that. However, we have looked at those um, powers that we have and have taken the decision that um, we would serve a notice with regard to an employer's overarching duty to provide a, a safe place of work. Um, and with that regard then, you know, why someone is under the control of an, um, an employer's direction, we would expect that employer to do all that is reasonably practical to keep them, them healthy. Um, and that's where that would come in. Um, and as Robert said, that would be in, in relation to a particular process or activity where uh, an employer hasn't put in measures or made any attempt um, to put in measures to control the risk. Okay. Um, Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much. Robert, um, first of all, I'd extend thanks to you and, and your staff for the help you've given us in the uh, Ards and North Town area. We had some issues there with, with some quite large businesses and manufacturing um, outlets early on and we uh, appreciate the efforts that were made and those businesses seem to continue uh, with obviously taking effective measures and putting in the necessary health and safety requirements. In relation to um, the health and safety and the management of it, I suppose it comes down to management of risk at the end of the day and uh, will you be looking for the businesses to carry out fresh risk assessments in relation to how they deal with the issues uh, go ongoing in relation to uh, dealing with COVID um, and 
as they open up their business. Will you be looking for fresh risk assessments to be carried out and um, will you be uh, reviewing that evidence if you walk into premises and, and after the public, for, for example, uh, raise an issue? Yeah, Gordon, I'll, I'll say very briefly, and again, I'll, I'll um, defer to my, my experts. But w one of the issues for uh, an employer who has more than five staff, <laughs> they must have a written risk assessment. Um, as we've said, that with coronavirus, this is a public health issue, um, but they need to consider the impacts of how coronavirus can impact in the workplace and they need to think about how they can apply social distancing measures. So really, it has to be part of that risk assessment. Whether they integrate it into a single assessment, I've, I've seen some people suggesting that there should be a separate COVID-19 risk assessment. Um, I don't think, to be honest, it, it matters hugely whether it's a separate one or whether it's integrated as part of the overall risk assessment for the business. But I think they have to consider all of the activities not everything from people arriving in the workplace um, so things like car parking um, coming in through entrance halls if people have to use a clocking in system um, transit areas so corridors stairwells which become pinch points for people movements and then the actual workplace itself be that office accommodation manufacturing and production lines so all of those things have to be considered as part of the risk assessment um, and on the, the, the directive, you mentioned about a directive, you, you're looking for a directive on the input on that, uh, you mentioned about uh, public health agency, I believe, obviously yourselves and probably the Department of Health um, and I assume local councils. Um, what what more work needs to be done on that, do you feel? Because it, you've, you've clarified the point that uh, businesses are going to have to knuckle down and, and produce risk assessments, but they are going to need clear guidance as to what to work to and what to work from. And at the moment, that's probably probably too vague if we were, we were to move forward and get businesses up and running within the next month. I think one of the key things which is being done is to try and prioritize the, the businesses in the order in which they're likely to resume activities. Um, obviously, food production and processing has been with us really from day one. Manufacturing has, has come online. Construction is coming online. There are still other business areas which will, will come online and will seek to come online in due course. I've had conversations with uh, a number of, of individuals and bodies um, some of which actually who wouldn't normally fall under HSENI's control or enforcement remit. Uh, but we're very willing to try and talk and to participate and assist in any ways we can. So, for example, the hospitality sector is looking at setting up a group to establish what they can do going forward um, and whether that's opening restaurants with a 30% or a 50% occupancy rate. Um, and I've been speaking to Hospitality Ulster in relation to that and any learning that we can impart from the work that we've done with um, existing businesses we, we will very gladly share that but i think it's fair to say there are still very significant challenges as i mentioned there are a number of businesses and business sectors where it is very difficult to see how they can become compliant with social distancing guidance um, and again i have to defer and say that it's not something which HSE can advise on. This is a public health matter. Um, and there are lots of people saying, if we wear this mask or if we wear this type of PPE, um, but that advice needs to come from scientific experts. Which I assume would come through the public health agency or the Department of Health. Yeah. Sorry, Brian Brian Munson here. Can I just come in? Right. There are uh, a number of um, sectoral guidance documents which have been already been uh, published by PHE in England, to which PHA here and ourselves will refer to, uh, and additional ones are being developed uh, at the moment uh, 
to expand the suite uh, that are available uh, and to look at, at whatever the latest information and guidance that's coming through from SAGE uh, and other groups um, is and how that can be contributed. So that is something which is ongoing uh, on a UK-wide basis at the minute. Um, and we're also um, in conversation, for example, with colleagues in other countries to see if there are any information coming through or ideas uh, which we can then utilise uh, and make apparent to, to businesses in Northern Ireland. And you obviously want clear guidance formulated as we move forward so that businesses are, to be fair, have you know a clear direction on what way to go around carrying out their risk assessment and, and managing the reopening of their businesses. Would that be a fair summary? I think one of the realities for some businesses is going to be around even the physical shape of the building and the accommodations that they have yeah. may present challenges. Um, so if you take one business which is maybe operating in a very tight and confined space, social distancing for that particular business becomes a real challenge. Whereas the same business operating in a more spacious building yeah. and can much more readily space their, their employees out so that there will be some very definite challenges and it's very difficult to apply a, a broad spectrum approach if you like in terms of sectoral guidance but um, we will certainly be working with public health colleagues to see what we can can offer in, in terms of advice and support. Great, thank you very much. Thanks Gordon. Thanks Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'll try and be uh, as brief as I can. Um, there seems to be a lot of grey areas around <laughs> this this advice. I, I know that at the very beginning we were all inundated with uh, complaints from employees, um, from companies who hadn't closed at that stage, yet others were closing around them. Uh, we were getting concerns, obviously, around social distancing and all of that. Now, we did find that when we did report these issues on behalf of constituents, that at that time we were advised that nobody actually would be going on site to obviously check these things out, but that they would make, yourselves would make contact with the companies, which which is fine and actually did work in some cases, but in other cases it didn't. Uh, we're now at a different phase where um, businesses are starting to reopen again and, and here lies the problem because uh, I know of, of, of businesses who technically if you read the guidance you, you could argue that they uh, should be closed but at the same time because they're not specifically mentioned they believe that there's nothing stopping them from opening. So who takes the responsibility? The, the police aren't taking responsibility uh, for um, enforcing the closures. Um, the councils aren't taking responsibility. So who actually says, look, you cannot open uh, and you should be closed, or, uh, you know, or, or, or really what you're saying is that's not a matter for yourselves, but as long as there's social distancing with inside the business, then, then that's, that's okay? The, the, the list which was published on essential businesses uh, was published as part of the GEO guidance. Mm -hmm. so it's not something which HSE and I have the power to enforce upon. Um, we obviously work where a business has chosen to open. We will work with them in to, seeking to ensure that they are offering a safe environment for their employees. But it is not for us to actually define uh, what businesses can and cannot open. Okay. Who, who does that then? You know, this is the problem, and I appreciate that. Look, where businesses have decided to open, my advice to them is: look, you need to ensure that you're social distancing. But the public issue is the fact that if they see, and I will use an example of, for example, uh, you know, a, you know, a barbers or, or something like that. You know, who is there to say no? Whatever social distancing you have in place, you actually should not be open. Who who makes that decision? My understanding on that one is that the CEO would have a power of direction. Well, I think, Chair, it is something we're going to have to come back to because um, we've heard from the chambers around guidance to, to open. This is going to be something that's going to cause a real problem. I know that there are specific businesses that, that have decided to open, and as far as I can see, there is nothing to stop them.
But look, no, no, I appreciate your, your comments and, and at least that clarifies that it's not yourselves that do that. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, folks, so far for the comprehensive um, updates. Uh, there's a lot in there. Uh, following on firstly from Gary's point, I think the po it is very well made. Guidance is one thing and, and the law is another. Um, over time, people start to see that guidance can just be taken advantage of. Um, I'm seeing here in East Andrum hairdressers uh, uh, reopening um, and doing so because they can be um, without any any real uh, ability to d how, how you can possibly um, get haircuts at two metres distance, I don't know. Um, and there's nowhere, no possible way to enforce that because nobody knows who to go to. I think you just said yourself, you think it's under the remit of the TU, but is it? Or who is it? If they're not a police matter, it's not a health and safety executive matter. Um, whose remit is it? And this is what we're going to start to see happening as this progresses, as we start to see the lockdown being lifted to a degree. The companies, most, as you say, will play ball and will try to be flexible and adhere to the rules that have been placed, but others won't. So where do you step in as an organisation if a company is refusing to follow the guidance and um, how is that enforced on behalf of um, people, customers or their employees? Okay. I suppose that the first thing, uh, just to clarify, John, for the likes of shops and offices, um, so that will cover hairdressers, beauticians, um, clothing shops, shoe shops, uh, things that you might find in the typical high street. Those businesses are actually enforced by local authority, so they fall under council inspection. So that's restaurants, takeaways, cafes, all of, all of that. So that enforcement normally falls to councils anyway, um, and that would be done under the environmental health officers. So we don't have, have a huge involvement in, in those areas. In fact, we would have no involvement under normal circumstances. For other businesses, the, the larger firms, um, again, a lot of this is coming down, I suppose, to economic decisions being taken. Um, and we've all heard in the media people talking about this construction firm and that construction firm, or indeed this construction project and that construction project. What is essential, what is not? Again, this is why it is not for HSE to determine what type of work activity or what sectors can and can open. Um, our key barrier is to ensure that where a business has chosen to operate, that they operate safely and within the public health guidance. Uh, and my understanding is that council colleagues are doing the same um, with these kind of, of shops and, and other business premises. Uh, and we are seeing a number of complaints coming through our notification system, which we would pass on to colleagues within councils, um, and they'll be having probably very similar conversations as we would have with the larger businesses in relation to should they be open, um, and have they thought about the risks that they're putting themselves, their staff, and their customers. And, uh, and I suppose the, the other point is just to draw attention to the public responsibility here. We all, as citizens, have a duty uh, and we're putting ourselves and our families at risk if we choose to, to go for the hairdressing appointment or to, to use some of these shops. Yeah, no, look, I, I totally agree. And while there's a mass amount of moral responsibility on people, and it, a lot of people are adhering to it, sadly, it is starting to unravel. And you only have to look down our high streets to see that a significant proportion of people aren't adhering to essential travel only. Um, I wasn't aware of that, and my apologies. I must contact council because it doesn't seem like they're aware of it either because I haven't seen any attempt by councils locally to be enforcing this on non-essential work. So what point, what size of a company would you kick in versus council kicking in? Uh, can I, I'll try well, here on this. Um, it's not on size of company, it's on the activity. So in general, um, it's retail, um, offices, shops, uh, food premises uh, where there's sales of food and the like would fall to the local councils and some leisure activities uh, and, uh, and the hospitality side of things. Uh, HSE and I tend to cover uh, manufacture, construction, agriculture um, and 
and those sorts of industrial processes. So it's based on process rather than uh, size. Okay, so once the guidelines are um, cleared up and we have less ambiguity, and hopefully that will be very soon, um, what is the process then if a constituent contacts me and says they've gone into work and a company is refusing to abide by the guidelines, they're in a the manufacturing industry, they're refusing to implement any social distancing, will you go in and inspect it once you have staff back able to do that and then enforce it if needs be once you've obviously worked with the company to transfer that? Yeah, we're, we're already doing that. Uh, we're on the ground um, where there have been uh, serious complaints made. Uh, we are visiting uh, premises. Um, the first line uh, remains initial contact through non-contact, uh, or sorry, through non-visits. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we can't get assurances um, that, that the issues are being addressed properly, we're visiting sites. Uh, again, um, businesses are then advised on options and asked to make changes. And if those aren't made and proper measures aren't put in place, uh, then we'll look to the prohibition notices. I, again, if you're referring people to us, a plea yep. is that they would give us contact details because it helps both in terms of bottoming out the issue, that, that the particular issues, the more granular that, that we can be, the better, uh, and also to follow up with them after it uh, to get their opinion as to what measures ha have actually been implemented. But you'll concede, I suppose, that some will be whistleblowers and not want to give those details. Are they completely confidential? Yeah, where, where yeah. The people can remain anonymous, uh, and we have dealt with a very large number of anonymous complaints. But it does give us some difficulties if we want to identify uh, specifics, uh, and it does mean we have no way of getting back to to the complainant to discuss what action has been taken. Okay. Uh, certain. Sorry, I'll leave it at that. Okay, no worries. No, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, John. John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you to uh, the staff of the HSE. I, I, can I also put on record my appreciation to uh, those members of staff of the HSE who I have been in contact with over this last number of weeks. I, I have found their responses to be quick and informative, perhaps not always what I would like to have heard, but certainly uh, there has always been a response, and they have given me a detailed response in each case, so I, I do appreciate that, and I'd like that passed on to your team. Uh, you in regards, uh, a number of questions have flowed to me around the enforceability of COVID-19 restrictions and social distancing. If we're dealing with guidance, how do you legally enforce guidance? Well, what, what piece of legislation would you, would you turn to uh, if an employer, and this is an, uh, an example uh, without any actual specific in terms of, because in terms of having come across an employer yet, it hasn't been responsible around this. But if an employer came forward and said, no, I'm not practicing social distancing, I, 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 I'm not going to do it, um, how would you enforce that? John, maybe I'll speak there. We would come back on to um, our in powers and the existing law that is there for employers in relation to the Health and Safety at Work Northern Ireland Order, which has been in place since 1978. And um, we would look at it in regard to an employer's overarching duty to provide um, a safe place of work, basically. So we would be enforcing against them. Okay, so it, it, but it was nothing to do with the, the regulations that were brought in by, by the health minister now enforced by, I think it's, as you said, into the TEO. You would rely on pre-existing legislation to enforce those rules? Yes, and, and that's okay. based on the overarching duty that an employer has within a workplace. And that would, um, where there is blatant disregard, it would give you the option to serve a prohibition notice that would stop a particular process or a number of activities where there is um, a, a breach of, you know, the public health guidelines in the workplace. Some of those um, are easier to look at than others in terms of systems of work uh, compared to social distancing. You know, sometimes an employer can have all the, the rules in the world in terms of social distancing and employees aren't following them. But in those circumstances, we would expect employers to look at increased supervision. They would identify areas where social distancing in particular is a problem, maybe around canteen areas, changing rooms, things like that, 
and would expect them to put measures in place to ensure those rules are enforced and, then, and that employees also understand um, their legal duty to follow those rules within the workplace as well. Okay, thank you, Clark. Can I just ask a question which is not directly related to the COVID-19 crisis? It's, it's in terms of, the, of your staffing and your staffing location. Um, I understand you have around 102 uh, staff. 95 of them, if my, if my information is correct, work in the Belfast office and seven work in the Oma office, which seems to have a disparity in terms of coverage. West of the band seems to have significantly less coverage that would be the case in the greater Belfast, or those, those counties uh, in around Belfast. How do you distribute your staff and how, how is the rest of the band covered? John, if, if I can just comment on that. The distribution of staff, uh, the fact that we have a small number of staff in OMA is not that those people cover the entirety of the west of the band. Um, really a key part of this is to give us an immediate and prompt response needed in those areas, but all of the staff from Belfast cover the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, so we have a small team there which is ready for immediate deployment, um, and they will do a number of different aspects of work, including construction, um, quarrying, agriculture, but the, the entire team of inspectors are deployable across the province. Uh, and maybe if I can add to that, part of my team as well as the home office are based in Fermanagh and as other people who live uh, in other areas west of the band and because of the nature of inspectors work will operate from home and then come back to one of the two offices when required um, and we're seeing increasingly now with the the COVID issues that that work model will probably continue uh, and expand. Okay thank you. Thanks John. Uh, Sinead? Sinead. Okay. I'm Hello, can you hear me? There, there she is. It's the delay. Hello. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, you can. Okay. Right. Uh, this here uh, question is really for Robert. Um, he, he mentioned in his briefing about the changing of human behaviours and how difficult it is. Um, uh, the HFE and I um, planning any public marketing campaign to, invite, uh, to advise uh, workers and employers um, how to return and how you know to work within the workplace once they do return. We, we obviously are building on the existing public health guidance unit, and you will have seen on our website we're using um, a lot of the same background information which is being used by the public health websites. We're trying to have a consistent message. Um, I think a lot of this, you know, we're very sociable people. When we meet people, we naturally shake hands. Um, we are comfortable around people. So it's very difficult to suddenly say to our staff, you need to maintain this social distancing. A lot of our workstations, a lot of our workplaces are set up in such a way staff do work in much closer proximity and I think it's something that we're going to see as, as time goes on um, and we're going to have to see very significant changes in how workplaces are configured um, if we are to maintain social distancing longer term but certainly we're working on the key messages that are coming from public health and say this is building on, on what is a public health message. Okay thank you. Thank you very much. That has been really informative. Can I just um, ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Gordon. Yeah. Just uh, on the airline issue, Robert, um, have you been involved with the, the issue of the, um, of the aircraft, loading of aircraft at, the, uh, at our airports? Uh, recently, have you been involved in giving advice there to, to the local airport? Our involvement. Um, with the, the airport themselves. Um, we, we have, following the, the reports of the Erlingus flight, and I know one of the challenges there for them was suddenly they went from having maybe 30 to 40 passengers on a flight to that particular flight, I think, had 120 plus passengers. Um, so we have been in touch with all three airports just to um, ask them to confirm what social distancing measures they are in place. 
um, and what, what they have now at the moment. The only flights which are carrying passengers is the, the flight coming in and out of, of the um, George Best airport. So I, I'm assured that they now have improved social distancing measures, additional staffing to help remind uh, passengers as they travel through the airport and move to different areas. The responsibility of safety actually on an aircraft um, sits with the Civil Aviation Authority. And uh, you, you haven't had, an, as an organisation, you haven't had direct input then into setting the standards for uh, loading of aircraft? You haven't had an input no. into that? No, uh, I understand that Aer Lingus have, have made comments around the actual loading process, uh, but I think again one of the challenges is, is really around an aircraft is a very small and confined space. And it's very difficult, uh, and obviously it will add to the, the timing of, of actually loading passengers on uh, to adhere to social distancing and moving people in in the correct order, loading the plane from the front to the back, the back to the front, etc., to stop passengers passing. Uh, and I think that is one of the real challenges going forward about how social distancing will apply to air travel more generally. So to clarify, you have an input on the management of the passengers within the airport, but not on the aircraft, which is a responsibility, I understand, of the, the, the National Transport Authority. The, the UK, Civil Aviation Authority. Yeah, and UK Civil yes, Aviation Authority, Authority, yeah. The, the International Air Transport Association um, also issued a press release yesterday yeah. um, recommending the wearing of, of uh, face masks. Okay, thanks very much for that clarification. Thanks, Chair. But can I just pick up on that then as well? Do the airlines not have a responsibility to limit their numbers on the planes in terms of implementing social distancing? My understanding, Chair, is that Aer Lingus have now recognised that, uh, and obviously their decision now to run two flights rather than one busier flight is an acknowledgement of that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, thank you again for your input. It has been really helpful. Okay. Um, we're moving on then to our, our next item on the agenda, which is the departmental briefing from the Insolvency Service. And I apologise to the officials who we've kept waiting for quite some time. Um, members, there is a clerk's memo at page 27 of your pack, and then there is a letter from the department at page 32 outlining the intention for the Department to bring forward an LCM on the Corporate Governance and Insolvency Bill, changes to insolvency and company law regimes as a consequence of the coronavirus outbreak. Um, on the line, I think we have Jack Reid, Richard Mons and Keith Brown. Is that correct? Yes, yes Chair. That's great, thank yeah. you. And apologies again. Um, if I could just maybe invite you to make an opening statement and then we will pick up through questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if I will lead, my name is Richard Mons, and I am the Director of the Northern Ireland Insolvency Service. Uh, as you say, also joining me remotely is Jack Reid, who is responsible for my organisation's insolvency legislation, and also Keith Brown of the Department's Better Business Unit, who is responsible for company and mutuals legislation. Uh, let me just start off by just giving a, a brief overview of the Insolvency Service. Um, we are based at Fermanagh House in Belfast City Centre, and we have around about just over 100 staff. Uh, the largest part of our operations is the uh, official receiver unit, which is responsible for investigating and administering bankruptcies and corporate liquidations. Uh, they will work with bankrupts and company directors to identify, uh, realise and distribute uh, to creditors any assets in the organisations or in their states, and then make references for any enforcement action that needs to be taken such as the director's disqualification or bankruptcy restriction orders. Uh, on the other side of the house, uh, we have our uh, finance unit, which is responsible for managing all the estate accounts, any monies which are realized in the estates of bankrupts or companies in liquidation uh, are lodged with the uh, departments in one of the department's bank accounts, the estate account, which we, we, we manage, and all payments uh, will be uh, operated from the insolvency service. We also have the, our disqualification unit, which is responsible for uh, making directed disqualifications and for bankruptcy restrictions orders being made against individuals as well, uh, making court applications for those uh, and taking enforcement action, uh, including uh, making representations to the Public Prosecution Office if, if uh, there's a criminal matter involved. And finally,
finally, uh, the matter which sort of brings us here today is our legislation unit. We have a small legislation unit which is responsible for making uh, our drawing up uh, legislation in, in relation to insolvency service. So that just gives a, a brief outline of the insolvency uh, service uh, as it operates currently. Uh, as I said, our, our business today is really in relation to the uh, proposed legislative consent motion. Uh, the department's liaison officer wrote to the committee on the 21st of April to set out the minister's proposal to bring a legislative consent motion to the assembly. And the letter set out that it was proposed that three amendments to North Ireland's insolvency legislation would be included in, in the Westminster Bill, which is now called the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Since then, it has been identified that legislation relating to mutuals is to, to be amended in similar terms to the amendments to be made to company law, so that these societies can take advantage of the measures where possible. Uh, these, these provisions related to mutuals are still being finalised, given the many different structures there are, that these organisations can take, <coughs> but I will outline the, the current thinking on these issues as well. In addition to the mutuals, uh, there are two further insolvency measures which have been proposed for inclusion in the Bill, and the Department will be writing formally to the Committee uh, in, the, in the near future to provide full detail of, of all the proposals. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I will briefly summarise now for you all the proposed amendments to the legislation uh, that are aimed at helping companies and mutuals to improve the chances of survival, protect jobs and support the, com the company's economic recovery. The Bill's measures will support businesses through this difficult period and, where needed, provide new options for company rescue and corporate governance measures. This will give directors more flexibility during the emergency to focus on the things that matter most while they have reduced resources and are subject to continued restrictions. It has been this department's policy and practice to maintain Northern Ireland's insolvency, uh, company and insolvency law in parity of that made in Westminster. However, to take some of the legislation through the Assembly would take many months. Accordingly, the Minister is seeking the Assembly's approval for the Bill to include amendments to Northern Ireland's legislation that will ensure local businesses can take advantage of the emergency measures at the same time as those in Great Britain. As I mentioned earlier, there are now eight measures included in the Bill, and I will briefly add them for you now. The first five relate to insolvency. The first measure relates to providing a moratorium to companies. The bill gives struggling businesses a form of breathing space to pursue a rescue plan. It creates a 20-day moratorium during which no legal action can be taken against the company by creditors without leave of the court. The moratorium can be extended for further periods of 20 days with the permission of the court. The second measure relates to the termination clauses in supply contracts. When a company enters an insolvency or restructuring procedure, suppliers will often either stop or threaten to stop supplying the company. The supply contract normally gives them the right to do this, but it can jeopardise attempts to rescue the business. The bill will mean that suppliers will not be able to jeopardise the rescue in this way. The next measure relates to the suspension of wrongful trading. At present, a court may order a director to be held personally liable where a company continues trading and the director knew or should have known that the company could not avoid insolvency. The bill will temporarily remove this threat and, as a result, remove the pressure on directors to close what might be an otherwise viable business. The fourth measure is aimed at helping struggling businesses by temporarily removing the threat of winding up procedures where unpaid debt is due to COVID-19. It also introduces temporary provisions to avoid statutory demands issued against companies during the emergency. This gives businesses the opportunity to reach realistic and fair agreements with all creditors. Now, the final and fifth insolvency measure will give the Department or Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, with the consent of the Department, power to make regulations to make temporary amendments to corporate or insolvency legislation. This would be done to keep to a minimum the number of businesses forced into an insolvency or, or restructuring procedure. Regulations could change the eligibility conditions for insolvency or restructuring procedures. They could provide for the procedures not to apply or to apply in a modified form in a particular cases. The next three measures apply to company law but are included as the provisions will extend to mutual societies. The first measure relates to a new procedure for restructuring. This will allow viable companies struggling with debt obligations to restructure under a new procedure. It allows courts to sanction a plan that binds all creditors to a restructuring plan as long as it is fair, equitable and in the interest of creditors. The second measure relates to annual general meetings. AGMs are central to good corporate governance, but current social distancing restrictions do not permit large gatherings. As a result, many companies cannot hold their AGMs in accordance with their constitutions. The bill temporarily allows those companies that are under a legal duty to hold an AGM to hold a meeting by other means, 
even if the Constitution would not normally allow it. And finally, the final measure relates to the filing requirements at Companies House. Companies are required to make a number of different filings by fixed deadlines at Companies House each year. Missing the deadline automatically results in a financial penalty. Companies House has already done it all it can under existing law to offer extensions to those deadlines. The bill allows for further extensions enabling struggling businesses to focus on the things that matter most while they have reduced resources and restrictions. It is expected that the bill will be introduced into Parliament during the week beginning the 18th of May and will be subject to a fast-track procedure which will allow it to receive raw assent two to three weeks after its introduction. Chair, that uh, concludes a brief outline of the measures that have been proposed for inclusion of FAR and I and my colleagues will be happy to answer any questions you may now have. Thank you very much for that. And um, you have said we'll be getting further information then in relation to mutuals shortly. Um, I guess I just wanted to pick up on a, a specific point then. Um, these measures are obviously all directed towards companies as opposed to individuals. Um, and um, there may be instances where someone has already um, entered into um, insolvency proceedings and has a debt relief order um, and the current circumstances um, obviously will interrupt or potentially could interrupt um, their payment plans and I was wondering has the um, have you given any consideration to that um, and what measures may be put in place to support individuals as well as the um, measures that have been put in place through this legislation to support companies well as it stands there are measures in place um, if, if individuals are subject to um, some sort of insolvency uh, uh, regime such as a an IDA or an uh, administration order, um, there are they can apply if they are in financial difficulties themselves and cannot meet the terms of their, their payment plan. They can approach uh, the, the person administrating or the company administrating the, the case. For example, with uh, individuals on the arrangements IDAs, uh, there is um, uh, they can be allowed up to I think it is up to a nine month payment holiday for those matters. And uh, for the likes of uh, other uh, payment plans, um, for the likes of the uh, enforcement of judges' office who administer administration orders, um, uh, uh, certainly they can be approached if, if individuals are in difficulties. They, they can approach those. These are subject to sort of different uh, legislation than we would cover ourselves. And for the likes of for ourselves now, for you mentioned debt relief orders. Um, those are, there would tend not to be payment plans in relation to those. So anybody who is currently subject to that relief order, the, 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 the current situation shouldn't uh, impact on that. That uh, debt relief orders provide and debt relief um, for all the main areas of, of, for example, credit and consumer debt. There are some exempted items, but if somebody uh, has got a, a DRO, then they, they shouldn't be affected by, by, by those matters. From our own perspective, um, we have uh, any bankrupts who we have um, can be subject to uh, income payment orders or income payment or arrangements, which requires them, if they have been assessed as having surplus income and they're still subject to bankruptcy restrictions, we can, or they, they are required over usually three, three years to make um, uh, payments into their state, which will be uh, then passed on the creditors. Obviously, if people are in financial difficulties, we will look very um, uh, kindly on, the, on any applications that people make to us, and we will certainly look at those on a case-by-case basis. Okay, appreciate that. Um, but just in relation to those who may be seeking um, flexibility, there, there, there is no formal um, arrangements around that the way banks have, for example, put in place mortgage holdies or other pro credit um, providers have put in place and payment holidays, that there is no plans to do something similar? No, not, not that we are uh, at the present time. I know there are, there are measures that have been launched to provide support to individuals through the furthering scheme uh, and to help businesses sort of keep staff on and keep staff paid through those measures. Uh, in terms of uh, individuals, there is nothing, the, the, these uh, matters relate um, purely to the, the corporate side of things, so there, there's no plans as yet to, to extend matters, for instance, to sole traders or, or, or other individuals. But there are there are sort of other measures in place which can provide support on the, on an individual basis. Okay. Yeah, Gordon, you're looking in. Yeah, just a point, a quick point. Is the LCM is it 
time bound? And do you see the the um, regulations reverting back to the standard conditions again after things settle down? Uh, there are some measures which are time bound. For example, the um, the uh, winding up orders and the um, statute declarations; those will be only in place for a period of six months. Um, so that's just to really give a, a breathing space. The other measures, are like the, the moratorium, uh, to allow companies a, a breathing space, those will um, uh, last beyond the, the, the period of the, um, the coronavirus uh, pandemic or crisis. So those are some will are, are, are purely time bound. Um, others will uh, always have been planned beforehand, um, but are just being brought forward now because it's considered that the bringing them in place now will provide assistance to companies who are struggling with the coronavirus um, problem. Do, do you see a time then it will all refer back to the normal standards? Well, the, 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 some of the, the, the measures will uh, maintain um, after the, 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 the coronavirus has um, sort of, uh, uh, passed us. So the likes of the moratorium will, will continue um, the, the termination clauses as well as the of facto clauses. Um, those will continue. Uh, the, suspension, the suspension of wrongful trading, that is a temporary measure uh, which has just been brought in to really take the pressure off company directors who may feel that if they continue trading, even though um, they may consider they, they could be held liable and have to pay money themselves and do, uh, to uh, as compensation, just really to, to take that pressure off them in the short term. So that, that is only a temporary one. The measure relating to winding up proceedings and statute demands will also be um, temporary. Uh, so that the, the matters relating to annual general meetings and the filing requirements, the majority, the majority of them will just apply to, during the current crisis, and then the service will be returned afterwards uh, as much as possible. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that. That has been helpful to us, um, and thanks for, for staying on the line um, when we, we kept you waiting so long. No problem Thank you. Chair, if it's helpful, um, it might be useful for me to be in direct contact to just seek some further clarification. Um, Richard, you, you obviously had a lot more detail there than the committee has seen as yet, and, and that might be helpful to have that, considering the very, considering the very, sorry, considering the very reduced time scale um, in terms of turning around the LCM, we don't have the normal. We're not likely to have the normal period. So, if you can forward on anything like that, that would be incredibly useful. We well, certainly will. You appreciate things are, are quite dynamic at the moment, so yeah, we're, uh, things sure. are changing almost on a daily basis. But no, absolutely, uh, uh, we have we have uh, a note drafted for you for 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 the committee, and I'll I'll, I'll see that that gets to you as soon as I can. Thank you. Um, yeah, on social media. Great. Um, Okay, members, then we're moving on to item number seven on matters arising. Um, there is um, 7.1 at page 10 of your table papers, a copy of correspondence from the Minister in response to a letter from the Renewable Heat Association regarding the 2019 RHI non-domestic tariff review. Um, so the tariff review is our next Just agenda item. Thanks. So. Um, are members content to note unless they have any actions to, to suggest? Mm -hmm. Noted. Um, 7.2 then is page 12 of the table papers. There is an updated copy of the table of responses from the department to issues raised by the committee in relation to the COVID-19 response. Have members any actions they want to suggest at this point? That the, that's the list of the... Yeah. That's, Chair, that's the, the SIP rep we get on a, a weekly yeah. basis, but I, I think... If members are, are in agreement, your dialogue or your readout from your discussion with the the, um, the minister has kind of Covered some speeded of things up as well. And maybe if we pick up on some other points yeah. in the correspondence. Just a couple. Chair, oh. Chair can I come in? Hold on, we think Gordon is coming in first. Go ahead, go ahead, there. Go ahead, Sinead. Sinead, sorry. Okay, so just um, just in relation to to um, that item. I think you know it probably uh, would be appropriate for us to kind of reflect the concerns that we've he heard at the briefing um, earlier from from the cham chambers. So they're obviously very worried about the lockdown uh, and how it's going to unwind and the sudden cessation of the uh, government support and how uh, you know if that does happen that there would be serious consequences uh, for the businesses. Is it appropriate for this committee to um, to call on the chancellor to show some? 
sort of flexibility um, and continue uh, a commitment to provide as much support as necessary um, to, uh, as the restrictions are beneath uh, and the recovery starts. I think it's really important that we have flexibility, imagination and generosity from the uh, current schemes as, uh, as it unfolds uh, as we move out of it. And particularly the, the issue about part-time furlough um, of employees. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a particular issue where, where employees could maybe work on a part-time basis but still get uh, government support for the, for the job and for security. Can, can we uh, do something in relation to that? You know, with the Chancellor and then uh, feed them back into the department as well. Yeah, yeah, we'll pick up on that, Sinead. Um, Gordon, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would agree with, with what, most of what she's saying. Just the, uh, a couple of issues that we're, we're all very, I suppose, motivated about and have been the grants. Mm -hmm. um, the 10K grant is still very restrictive. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, the subletting, as I call it, or subrenting, never yeah. it has been very, very limiting, and, and very few people have been able to get access to it. So, it's too restrictive. Um, the the other points that, that were made is, is in relation to um, yeah, the multiple sites issue. Mm -hmm. The multiple sites issue is still one that we still get quite a bit of correspondence on. Mm -hmm. I got someone when I was sitting here during the meeting. I think we still need to see something there uh, on the multiple sites, whether it's yeah. two, three sites or uh, with a limit on it or a cap on it or it's incremental in some form. I think we still need to do, deal with that. And that the point is well made uh, earlier about the furlough scheme. Mm -hmm. Simon and so on were very strong on that, that they think it needs to be continued on a maybe a reduced basis. And uh, I think it's something we need to, to push on. Um, Peter, I was going to um, pick up on some of the issues yeah. in relation to because cor there's some correspondence, but we may as well yeah. do it now since the day has been discussed. It's helpful. Um, I have a, a, a spectacular spider diagram um, that I have made notes from in terms of there were a number of issues raised, particularly by the uh, chambers, about what would be helpful for them. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is if, if members are content, I'll gather all that up and get a memo out to members that we can then take forward, because I'm conscious that mm -hmm. um, there might be other stuff members want to add to that. Yeah. And that would then, Chair, inform correspondence going further on. I think it might also be useful um, to get a video call as well. Mm -hmm. um, if I try and organise that sort in the next couple of days, I'd come out to members um, this afternoon looking at availability either tomorrow or, or Friday to do a video call, because I'm just really conscious of the fact there's a number of issues there that members want to pick up and are, 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 there's a lot of scope for further discussion that I think would, would really help inform um, correspondence going forward, Chair. Mm -hmm. So if members are, are content, I gather up and, and get a time Yeah, for I that. think that would be useful. I think um, the, the point is made about the, the, the furlough scheme and um, I think we should do that by the executive as well, yeah. right to, to the ministers with responsibility there. Um, there are a number of obviously sectors, like Gordon has said, that are still missing out of support. Um, and I, I have been dealing with the, the childcare providers for the 25k grant. Mm -hmm. There's physio correspondence from, yeah. from those. Um, you know, there's various organisations that I think we do need to, to pick up on. Um, and the you know the, the how we're going to manage the, the support going forward. Um, obviously, there still is a bit of frustration from, from certain sectors. We do still need clarification around social enterprises to the 25k yeah, grant right, yeah. um, as well. So I think perhaps mopping all of that up in terms of um, how, how we deal with it going forward will, will be useful. Sorry, the, the leisure providers as well, you know, the Eddie Irvines and, and the various other family entertainment centres that employ 10, 12, 15 people, they have been hit very heavily. They had documentation on the, on, the, on the table last week, and I think we, we moved quickly over it, but they feel that they have been excluded. We're looking to organise a briefing from the forum. I think that's yeah. possibly in correspondence as well. Um, so Chair, can I just suggest as well, um, it was raised about businesses um, with over um, NAV over uh, 51 caters, absolutely nothing for them. And when you look at that, you know, you, you may say it's, it's, it's like most of the pubs in Belfast, all hotels, etc. I mean, that is that is a real crisis in relation to 
um, in, in relation to those businesses. And we heard very passionately in, in the house yesterday by Pat Tapney talking about, you know, just the, the, the major issues. They don't have the cash reserve uh, and they're very, very reluctant to take any loans at all because they don't know how um, their business is going to survive beyond. Particular issue I have raised with the minister in, in every call that I have done with her, as well as as, as we have done, done so last week. Um, and I think that the point is well made about rates relief, but businesses need cash support as well. Um, and I think that, that that is something that we we will continue to highlight. Um, and I think that yes, let's let's get a, a list of what we want to, to put into correspondence sure and, I'll, I'll, and um, communicate that. I bring that together, get it out to members quickly, and then we'll do a video call in the next couple of days, just because there's. There's so much information, particularly today, from the chambers, mm -hmm. uh, that I think is incredibly useful, Chair, in terms of the recovery on the other side, the plans that need to be put in place. Also, from, from what we've heard from um, HSC and I, um, there's a lot of clarification, Chair, required there from, I think, potentially um, Health Minister and Executive Office um, around responsibilities, enforcement, um, the, the the issue potentially arising from an LCM is always the case that it's done very rapidly. So the emergency regulations um, brought in as an LCM um, has given responsibility and authority in a lot of areas to departments, including the, the Department for the Economy. But a lot of the enforcement is uh, legal based, i.e. It, it's um, taking issues through the court. And I think what has certainly come out of the discussion today, Chair, is what about enforcement on the spot? The businesses that are already operating, how does the HSC get that support? What happens in terms of the um, issues that are still left with the local authorities around uh, environmental health mm. seem to be yeah. unclear there. Yeah. So uh, I think, Chair, if I can scoop up those issues as well, that's probably the only one worth yeah. talking about. You know, no, no, it was just to come back. I, I, I don't know where we were going to raise that. I was maybe going to raise it at the end, but yeah. absolutely, I think it is important we do get clarity. It's a huge issue, and what you're start, what I'm starting to see is that one person's almost chancing their arm to do it, mm -hmm. and other people are saying, well, if they're doing it and they're making money, then I'm going to do it. And, and it creates a snowball effect, and if there's no clear, and, and certainly today, it is evident that there's no clear, uh, there's no clarity around who's responsible and uh, you know if it means writing to the executive office or writing to the health minister to get clarity I think we need to do that um, but it, it is because it is going to come uh, more of an issue but I don't know if you propose it now or whatever. Well, yeah. Chair if we scoop all that up I think it's yeah. important to get it all down so members can have a, a discussion around that and if I scoop all that up and we get the video call in the next couple of days then which then will allow us very rapidly through agreement by correspondence to get letters organised. We can do all that before next week's meeting and then reflect on it then if that's yeah, and, um, doable. Just if we're going to highlight issues specifically to the British Chancellor, um, I'd also like to highlight the issue of, of, of the windfall tax to yeah. those companies who have made massive profits out of yeah. this um, crisis, the likes of Amazon and, and yes. others. Um, and I think that's a particular issue that we could pick up on as well. Chair, it'll also... Um, be helpful then to be able to talk more about potential detail around the hardship fund mm -hmm. um, yeah. that I know I think members wanted to talk about as well and obviously the detail is being announced formally next week but a video call might just allow members to get some clarification mm -hmm. um, on what there might be in that so I gather that and we'll organise the video call mm -hmm. and it'll just give a more uh, greater ability for members to talk sort of more yeah. freely and interactively on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to be able to see each other as well. Sorry, sorry, I know that the, the, the minister's up tomorrow as well in terms of that. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. that's correct. Yeah. You know, there may be an opportunity. I don't know what the minister's going to say, but certainly there may be an opportunity to ask some questions around this stuff. I uh, get the I get the memo out yeah. fast. Yeah. Um, Chair, that was something else I'd, I'd intended to flag up. Um, if, if you'll indulge me a second on that one, is uh, members will recall committee a bit of committee discussion in one of the video calls about. Um, the reinstatement of question time. Mm. That, again, has been, I think, the, the continued um, arrangements will, will go on for at least another four weeks. But what has, I think, been agreed, from my understanding, is that the ministers that come to the ad hoc will be those who would have been scheduled to do question time. So tomorrow will be justice and economy, and as, as Mr Middleton says. Um, that will give members an opportunity, but it's getting the questions in and down but just 
for that flag up, if nothing else, that the economy minister will be there tomorrow. Um, and we're still um, pinning down whether or not we can get the minister next week. We, okay. we, we're still seeking confirmation on that. And we'll try and transform that into a, a more interactive and longer session, because I appreciate um, our desire to hear from everybody quite often means we, we get very limited uh, levels yeah. of interaction, and that's mea culpa, and that's for me to continue to try and work out. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chair, but I think, in fairness, you know, the Chair's briefings are very useful, because if there's any issues in the meantime, we can feed them through and, and get responses, because I find that when the Minister comes, a lot of the stuff's quite repetitive, you know, because we're all getting the same issues, you know, around the 10k schemes, and we need to see that addressed, but sometimes when we're doing that, it can, be, it can, it can become so long that we just don't have time to get through the other issues. So that, yeah. that, that has been helpful, Chair, for, for me in terms of getting the issues through so that then I can feed them on to you for the ministerial yeah. call. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious again of time and we, we probably yeah. should Move get with, through with the agenda. So we, I take care of all that and I, I'll get back to members in the next couple of days over that. Okay, thank you. Um, we're then moving on to item number eight, which is the departmental briefing in relation to RHI review. There is a ministerial letter um, concerning the non-domestic RHI consultation on the tariff review at page 37. The non-domestic RHI consultation on the tariff review consultation document is at page 39. And the um, non-domestic RHI consultation review press release is at page 52. There are papers from the Renewable Heat Association at page 55 of your pack. Um, as outlined by the Minister during her oral briefing last week, the Department has launched a review of the tariffs under the non-domestic RHI scheme and is consulting on a proposed increase in tariffs based on the recommendations in a recent report by Cornwall Insight. Any changes in tariffs will require primary legislation in the Assembly um, and the consultation is due to close on the 26th of May. Have members any actions that they wish to suggest at this point? Um, and maybe suggest that whether we write to the Minister highlighting the committee's wish to be briefed on the outcome of the consultation. Um, yeah, Chair, that would be very helpful. Yeah. The, the, the committee generally um, reserves a position as to act as super consultee once we've had some um, initial um, briefing on what the analysis of responses have been. So if members are content, that would be a really useful way forward. Okay, thank you. Um, then item number nine is the examiner statutory rules eight reports of the session 2019-20. There is a copy of the report at page 59 of your pack. Are members content to note? Great. Thank you. Um, item number 10 then is correspondence. Um, there is a memo from the clerk of the committee for infrastructure at page 6 to 7 outlining concerns raised by the Committee for Infrastructure regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the taxi industry and a request to consider the initiation of a scheme to offer financial assistance to that industry. Um, I would suggest we forward to the car department for correspond or the, cor the correspondence to the department for a response. Um, but also just to pick up on the issue around um, guidance to taxi drivers in terms of safe operating. Yes. Um, I think that's a particular issue in terms of an enclosed space and one that we should take up with the department. Chair, we have had some um, info back on that, that um, people are experiencing an awful lot of different, as you say, situations when they get into taxi, because taxis are still running, although obviously there's a, a lot of taxi drivers aren't aren't able to, to work or there are issues, but it does seem to be incredibly varied as to what uh, you know format their their cars are in so there, i think there's mm -hmm. there's a need for guidance there if it doesn't already exist yeah. so we, we yeah too we do need guidance because again as people as businesses start to go back people are you know taxis were, were slow for a while because they were they were uh, not doing their usual usual stuff but the fact that businesses start to open again um i i've had numerous taxi men on looking for for guidance yeah. and and we don't have any really at this yeah. point yeah yeah clarification okay. Um, 10.2 then, there is a, a letter from the Chair of the Bar Council at page 68 on the impact of COVID-19 and the adjournment of a significant amount of court business on the legal services sector. Um, are members content to forward that correspondence to the Department for a response? Agreed. Yep. Um, then at pay, or item 10.3, there is correspondence from CO3 at page 72 in regards to the impact of COVID-19 on the charity sector. Um, there is a briefing outlining the findings of a recent survey carried out by CO3 and what could be done to alleviate um, those problems. 
Um, our members content to, to forward that correspondence on to the Department for a response in terms of the consideration of support measures for the third sector. Yeah, have you any further information on it, Chair? From no, not at this point. From your discussions with the Minister? No. Chair, I think um, the Minister has, in a few responses, um, both in interviews and in the Chamber and so on, indicated that there is work ongoing mm. and potentially some aspects might be um, looked at within the hardship fund. But I think the Minister has acknowledged that there's still probably going to be work to do beyond the hardship fund, even certainly from the issues that have been raised here today, that the hardship fund will capture probably a lot. But there are obviously new things that we're finding out um, that will need further thought, and the Department can work on those. Um, um, 10.4 then, page 16 of your table pack, there is a report from the University of Edinburgh Business School on the early impact of COVID-19 on UK entrepreneurial firms. Um, it's an interesting in mm -hmm. briefing. Um, our members agreed to send it on to the department for their Great. information. Yep. Um, then 10.5, there's correspondence um, at page 26 of the table pack from the Provost of Coleraine Campus of Ulster University um, regarding um, a proposal uh, for a research um, grant in terms of recovery interventions for the small business sector. Um, our members content to forward that to the Department for Information. And right. I was also going to propose that a right. letter of support for the, the research application, if members would be content to, to provide that. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then item number eleven is any other business? Has any anything anybody else wants to raise? No oh, thanks. Okay. Um, and then the final thing on the clear is um, date and time and place of next meeting, which is next Wednesday morning at ten a.m. in room thirty. Chair, Thank possibly you. just worth um, flagging up before we go is we we are hopefully. Um, going to be able to use the new system that oh, allows yes. people to, well, I haven't seen it used yet, so I'm not entirely sure what it does, but my understanding vaguely is that it takes the, the team's meeting, so everybody's in their square, and it can broadcast that. So we can either have fully virtual meetings or hybrid meetings, which is more likely, but just so that members are aware that we're likely to be talking about that in the next few days, potentially trying it at next week's meeting. So bear with us on that one, because it's, it's probably going to be complicated. And, yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.